All right, perfect. All right then. Well, got nothing else to wait for. Let's get it started then. Right now. Whew. All right. So, for any of you who were uh, here for my uh, Tales of Eternia run, in the U.S. It's out, it was actually called Tales of Destiny 2. But as I said in that run, it has nothing to do with uh, this game or anything story-based with it. It was just a uh, <clears throat> licensing issue, so they had to name it Tales of Destiny 2 to make it have some sort of relations as a Tales of Game in the Tales of series. But anyway, one of the first things you may notice is the dialogue boxes are moving extremely fast. And that's a little cool little feature that seems to be only in this game that if you hold the circle button down at max message speed, it'll actually wrap through all the text boxes for you. So there's no need for me to just constantly mash like you probably heard a lot of in my Tales of Eternia run. So one of the first things I like to say is for those of you who has played a uh, Japanese PS1 or a Japanese PS2 game, you notice that after playing uh, English and Japanese back and forth that they sort of switch between the X button and the circle button. So for some reason, this is mapped out just like a Japanese game. The circle button is for attacking and the X button is for skills. So for a first time player playing a lot of English, Japanese games, that might throw you off. Because it definitely did for me. Oh, no, no, no. The jump spell, uh, jump spell glitch is not in this game. That was only a Tales of Eternia thing. So, another thing I like to say is, since it was the very first Tales of game to actually get released over here, they didn't even bother hiring English voice actors for this game, so you're actually going to be hearing the Japanese voices for this game. Alright, so first off, we're unarmed, so we gotta run away from there. So we gotta go find a weapon. Where we're gonna need to head to is hidden room in the back. Oh, there's these boxes in the way though. Oh, and here we are. What's that in the back? Now another cool thing is, it doesn't seem to fast wrap immediately when you talk to an NPC, but if you hold L1, it actually acts as circle button as well for menus. <clears throat> so one of the things that I do is I hold L1 a lot so it can fast wrap through text immediately. Alright, so for this first battle, he's actually pretty easy. Since I have Demlos, I can always cast a spell. So, the first spell I have is Fireball, and that gets rid of him immediately. <laughs> that was tough. Now there's going to be one more fight on this uh, ship before I can leave. There are a lot of optional ones here as well, and I can get myself into another battle if I don't watch it here. All these enemies, if you touch them, you get thrown into a battle. I can run away from it, but... We don't like to waste time when we're speed running. All right, this one, he has a little imp buddy with him. So as long as he doesn't block any of these two fireball shots, he should die in one shot. Oh, his ax actually blocked one of them. All right, it's gonna take a little longer now. All right, the imp's weaker than him. Two long range hits and he's out. All right, and we're out of here. So, um, one of the really weird things about Fireball in this game 
enemies can actually block spells. That's one of the things you can actually uh, see when you're fighting these first two barbarian fights. Either one of the fireballs can hit the uh, axe, destroying both of them in the process, or the barbarian can actually block the fireballs. If he blocks even one of them and even takes the second one, he won't die. For some reason, a lot of these enemies love to block early game. Now, um, unlike Tales of Eternia, Holy Bottles actually do not reset the step counter. So, what that means is, for this entire run, we're going to be going into a lot of unnecessary battles. So there's going to be a lot of fleeing. Fleeing in this game is actually a little bit different from the other Tales of games. You actually have to go into a command menu and order the party to retreat. And the bar in the top right corner will start to fill up. Once it's fully filled, the entire party will attempt to flee. Now, here's the thing though. Just because your party starts to flee doesn't mean it's over yet. If every member of the party gets hit one time, the flee is completely canceled. And you'll have to try to retweet again. So, when you get a certain enemy set where you're surrounded by enemies, it can be pretty troublesome. So, one of the things I attempt to do when these situations come up is I try to attack the enemy before the meter completely fills. So he'll be a hit stun when I try to run away. But if at least one character attempts to get off screen during the uh, retreat strategy, then the rest of the party will run. So at least you have that going for you. Now, first thing you'd have to do here is go get Chelsea, but we won't be using her at all. She's only in the party temporarily. She'll be out as soon as we get back. Now later on, I'll be getting an item called the Magic Mist that will actually make that uh, meter drain twice as fast. But that won't be until halfway point in the game. Oh, and another thing I should mention. Since this is one of the first of Tales of games, um, you might catch a couple of uh, skills that are actually familiar to you, such as Demon Fang, but you'll notice that they'll have sort of a different name to them. Let me give you an example here. Demon Fang's called Missile Sword in this game. Tempest, the jump spinning slash attack, is actually called Spin Slash in this game. Now early on, I don't have uh, access to Holy Bottles, so there's going to be a lot more of these encounters showing up. But once I get my hands on some, they'll be a lot less frequent. But yeah, the early Tales of Games had really, really high step counters. So you got into a lot of random encounters. Now, I can't speak a little bit more on these step counter besides that uh, Holy Bottles really don't do much to it. Now, even though Holy Bottles don't completely stop encounters, they do do something to it. Now, whenever you don't have a Holy Bottle, you are given a number in between, I believe, 70 and 129. Now, whenever you get an encounter, it chooses a number in between one of those I've uh, explained back. and. If you have a Holy Bottle in effect, you know, the little white aura that surrounds whatever party member you're controlling, it'll always um, start at a 255, I believe. So that way it's actually a set number, and 255 is as high as it'll go for this game. So it's actually a little bit random at the beginning before you have Holy Bottles. Mostly in this town, you just have to do a little bit of talking. You have no way of getting out of this town at first. This woman lost her passport. Good guy Ston had to tell her where it's at. 
And then we meet our first actual party member, Mary. Now Mary is actually a really, really important character early on. I'll get into that a little bit later, but all I want to say right now is Mary is our MVP for the first half of the game. She'll play a really, really huge role. But right now, she's mostly a boss killer. Since Stun doesn't really have really good skills early on, Mary starts with a really good one in Beast Blade. Oh, and I should also say, since this was a very early Tales of Game, another thing is, this was before shortcuts. So, for uh, partner skills, I'm actually going to have to go to the skill menu and pick it time and time again in order to get them to use it. Another good thing about it is if you select them twice before they use it once, they'll actually use it twice. So you don't have to do it one by one by one. So at least there's that. Well, you can get Mary back later, but you have better characters by then. She does play a really, really big role for the first uh, half of the game. Alright, so our first quote-unquote boss battle will be ahead. It'll just be three soldiers. This one's pretty simplistic. All I'll have to do is have Mary just spam Beast Blade. Stan is extremely weak at this point. And the soldiers have this double slash attack that can tear through his HP really easily. So I kind of take it easy here with having him fight up with the front lines. He's so under level at this point, he actually doesn't have Missile Sword. So he has no skills right now. So pretty much Mary carries the entire team on her back for this fight. Oh, and I hope y'all like this voice clip, she says. You're gonna be hearing that a lot. Whoops. Oh, I forgot to mention that too. When you order one of your teammates to use a move, if they get hit before it happens, it gets canceled. So you have to order for them to use it again. All right. The formation kind of messed up because the soldier actually got in the middle of them but it was all right as long as no one dies here if anyone dies and you complete the fight they get zero experience and it's very important that stun actually gets out of this fight because he'll actually get missile sword and that's important for the upcoming boss battle which actually isn't too far from here Honestly, I wonder how many people, when they saw the schedule, expected this to be the PS2 version. Come on, be honest with me. If there's one thing I can say, I have been routing the PS2 version for uh, Leon's side, but I haven't really gotten to running that yet. Ooh, right before getting in the village. Yeah, it's Japanese only. Yes, it actually did borrow some of its graphics from Fantasia's uh, SNES. But the battle is a little more advanced than SNES uh, Fantasia. 
They actually based this uh, entire engine for the PS1 version of Fantasia. And also, did a little bit more with the battle system. That's when they first actually added shortcuts to the battle system for the whole series, is PS1 Fantasia. Yeah. That's the double edged sword of having a string front page. Gotta expect some fools. Also, I should probably should talk a little bit more about the uh, Sordian. So, for the people who haven't played this game, um,. The swords Stun and Ruti use at the moment are actually special swords called Sordians. They are talking magical swords, if I want to be short and blunt about it. And they actually have um, spells that come with them. Now, you have to equip these in order to use the spells that they have. Thought I have enough money. And um, in this game, you can actually switch characters who can use Sordians to use each other so for right now Stan's default Sordian is Daimlos and Rudy's is at white Daimlos is fire based so he has fire spells such as fireball as you've seen in the uh, first few battles that I did Rudy's is at white she has a uh, water based spells it's mostly healing uh, spells and such now for this next upcoming battle I'm actually gonna switch their Sordians around so Stan's gonna have at white in his hands and Ruti is going to have Demlos for this fight. I'm going to have her using Fireball while I have uh, Stomp playing sort of Keep Away. And Mary's going to take care of the soldiers to the left because we're surrounded by, I believe, six soldiers. Three on the right and three on the left. Mary can take care of all the soldiers herself. But the soldiers on the right, I'm going to have Ruti spam Fireball to help out Mary. And once all the soldiers on the left are taken care of, they'll all just gang up on the ones on the right, and they'll just be over then. Now, you don't have to use the Sordians. There's actually a couple of times where I choose just a basic weapon over the Sordians. That won't be anytime soon. Now, Sordians are a little more special since um, there's these discs you can get for them that can add a spell that they normally can't use, or it can increase their stats. They also can level up with the character as well if you have them equipped, in which after a certain level they learn new spells. So yes, Sordians in a way are actually like a character you actually can't control, but they're really, really useful. But they get obsoleted at a certain point. Now I have to really watch Mary because after you kill a certain enemy, the cursor sort of rolls over to any other uh, enemy out there that it wants to. And that can be very dangerous if she goes all the way to the back of where the soldiers are. And she can get ganged up on and she can die really easily that way. She's actually getting ganged up right now. After I said all that. Alright, that's all of them. And now it's curtains. If you notice, the Beast Blade actually knocks them into the air. And if they're at the end of the screen, she can juggle them. That is one of the reasons why I say Mary is MVP of the first half. Alright, so just when you thought it's all over, there's another boss battle. But this one, I'm not going to be winning this one. Now, I will say this, you can win this fight. 
if you do somehow win this fight, it triggers an alternative ending. That is the bad ending of the game. Leon has 9,999 HP. And being at this level, you will do very, very little damage to him. So, it'd be a very, very long fight, with more than likely the outcome being losing. In that alternative ending, though, Stom becomes the bad guy. He joins uh, Ruti as a thief. It's a pretty short ending, but it's funny. Yes, it actually is. I use a uh, sort of power leveling strat for that. They're uh, separated by categories, though. There's a bad ending category and a uh, just a normal ending category. Bad ending is easily under an hour. But yeah, once you get that bad ending, the game ends right there. I actually never tried it on PS2 to see if you could actually win the fight against them. If you played on like New Game Plus and then just juggled him or something. It'd actually be worth taking a look into. I don't know, he probably triggers some instant kill move or something if you beat him too hard. Now I think about it, that game's got a lot of unwinnable battles. I remember I tried to kill Hugo on Leon's side and his HP just turned to a question mark. Look at that painting on the left. That's pretty crazy to look at that considering what kind of game this is. Okay, so I guess they just do that to everybody in the game. That's pretty lame. So they took out the bad ending. Alright, so, I was skipping through all this dialogue so fast you probably didn't notice it, but I have received 10,000 gold from the king himself to spend on whatever I want, so this is where we start doing our little shopping trips. I'm gonna get some orange gel, some light bottles, and some holy bottles. Now, holy bottles are actually crazy cheap in this game compared to some other games. There's only 40 gold each. Now, I'm gonna get a little cheap here. And here, we have an item called E-Bullets, which actually stand for Electric Bullets. These little things are crazy overpowered for the beginning of the game. And I'll tell you why. The damage you can usually output this early in the game really isn't that high. The E-Bullet ranges from around 200 to 300 damage each, and it's a usable item. So you can just keep spamming it and spamming it, and you kill enemies at the Stralized Temple in about two hits with it. I'll only be buying 15, which is the max. So after I use those 15, you won't be seeing the E-Bullet anymore because by then I'll be able to actually output damage better than that. For an item that does that much damage, they're actually pretty cheap. Cheap as in costing gal, that is. 
Now I should mention one thing. This will be pretty much useless to me doing a speed run right now, but I did a little bit of research into this game and I actually found out you can actually reset the step counter with a holy bottle. I didn't, you know, go into full explanation with that. As I said before, that you couldn't with just using a holy bottle, but you can. But it involves having to take the step counter all the way to zero. So whatever number you start with, after every step, you would have to make sure it hits zero. Now, after it hits zero, you don't get an encounter if you stand still. If you move again, you do get one. But if you use a holy bottle while the step counter is at zero, it does reset it. So, unless you have the memory watcher open, taking a look at the step counter going down and stopping at zero every time, it's almost nigh impossible to find out how to do that in RTA. All right, so it's a straight last temple right here. All right, so there's this barrier right here, and there's five crystals spread around this church, and we gotta go find them. Each crystal is guarded by a lizard man. Now, those e-bullets I brought up before, this is where they start coming in handy. Two e-bullets, and they're gone. Now, there is a very small chance that they can actually survive both e bullets if the damage ranges are low enough. Most of the time, that doesn't even happen. So, all, all five of the uh, crystal fights here are gonna go exactly like that. Now, I believe after this fight, uh, Ruti gets a skill called Search Gal, where she just looks on the ground and uh, tries to scoop up some extra Gal for the party. I turn this off immediately because it's actually bad to keep that on. Because if she's doing no action and she's just standing there long enough, she'll use that skill. And if your party is in need of healing, she can't cancel out of that animation to start healing, so... If you start searching for Gal and somebody's about to die, well, you're gonna have to wait till that's over or use an item. Did a little brain fart there. I thought I had them all. <laughs> Didn't do these yet. My bad. <laughs> Sometimes I get a little ahead of myself. I think I've already done everything I need and then I'm already thinking of the next objective. Alright, so this is the last one. So after they're all defeated, you go beyond that door to find the uh, priest of the temple. And you take them over to the uh, cathedral room. There'll be one more little switch puzzle and then we'll leave. There's no boss here and there's no random encounters. The only monsters you fight here are the ones guarding the crystals. Nah, this isn't GBA. You're probably thinking of Fantasia.
Oops. Some of these little smaller spaces with uh, the running speed of this game can be a little tough. You might see me make a little couple of movement errors because of this. It was weird coming back to this after Eternia the other day. Just the way they control and uh, the speed of the characters. Oh yeah, the final boss on the PS2 version. Don't even get me started on that guy. It felt good when I finally beat him though. I just get I got so tired of that dude using that penetrate shield move. Like I have him down to the percentage to get a Stan's mystic art to finish him off instantly and then he used the penetrate shield so I can't use it without breaking the shield so I was like okay mister this is what I'm gonna do I'm gonna use an all divide so you can't kill me Barbados was not even nearly as bad he's weak to sound so I just juggled him with uh what was that move called Rondo like he was free after I figured out what he was weak against. Oh yeah. And Time Stop worked on him too. That was another thing. I took full advantage of that. Well, the first half he is. Once he gets to the point where he can use that, what was that one move, where he charges up for like five seconds and if you don't hit him enough times out of it, he'll instantly kill everybody. At that point, time stop starts, stops working on him all together. Oh, time stop gets rid of uh, penetrate shields? Wish I would have known that. I think I had that by then too. I'm actually mad now that I know that. That fight was a struggle for me. Alright, now we're back. Gotta go give the king the update. Then we'll be heading out to Cherik, which will be the first time where we start using. Well, not using. The first time we'll be doing the warehouse mini games. This was taken out of the PS2 version. So, in every town's harbor, there's this. There's these two warehouses. Sometimes there's more than two. But there's these warehouses where they have these boxes inside. If you put, if you place these boxes in the right area, it'll net you an item. Now, some of the items are not that useful. Some of the items give you different results if you place the boxes in a certain time limit. Now, I'll be doing a few of them because they have these items that actually summon you know, like the summon spirits such as Efri, Sylph, Luna. The first one I'll be doing will give me Efri, but I won't be using that until a later boss fight. Now the reason I grab these is because a lot of the early boss fights in this game have a lot of the little small fish with them, and they're very annoying to deal with early on, so by using Efri it gets rid of them instantly, and it also does massive damage to the main boss as well.
Now, unless you look up a guide or you get a certain item, you're not supposed to know about the warehouse mini games and where to place the boxes. But in the extra dungeon in this game, there's this item that you can get called a lantern. And once you enter those warehouses with the lantern, it'll tell you all the solutions that there are. By the way, if you talk to that bartender right there, he'll give you a liquor bottle and a flare bottle. Flare bottles have the same effect as they did in Eternia, besides debuffing your defense. And flare bottles are actually rare in this game, so you can't buy them. Liquor bottles, that'll actually have a use later on for its uh, debuffing attack. So a little something something I do with that. It'll actually come pretty soon. But first is Sea Dragon. Alright, we need to go get the pickaxe out of that room up there. All these other rooms are actually locked, and you need the pickaxe to actually open them up. We don't use keys here, we have a pickaxe to pry open doors. But these other doors actually have nothing useful in them right now, so... I don't bother with it. Now when you first come to this place, there's encounters. You'll be coming back here later. And it's just completely encounterless. Right now, this place is crawling with sea creatures such as starfish. The most dangerous sea creature of all time. Alright, so we have another Sordian in our possession. This one is for Philia. Clemente, his speciality is actually having a wider range of offensive spells. Now, I will be using him a little bit. Right now, he's actually pretty useless. But after I do a certain something, he will be very, very useful. I'll get into that a little bit. I don't want to spoil the surprise just yet. Despite its big size though, it's actually, it's not actually that powerful, <laughs> compared to the other Sordians at least. Now I also didn't mention, Leon also has a uh, Sordian himself, Chaltir, and it's an earth-based spell, so he has a bunch of earth-based magic. Don't use any of his spells either, they're not really that useful. All right, now we're out of there. And this guy, this little... One of those um, seamen on the ship can block your way when you're trying to leave the ship. Now, how you know you're on the one of the right squares, you can hear a little clicking sound when you drop it in the right spot and there we go there's our treasure chest and we got Efri now when you use these items Efri will pop out he will go all over the battlefield and punch burning everybody and it does about a thousand damage each easily will wipe out the smaller enemies Knock a pretty huge dent in the first boss I'll use it on. Alright, so you see those two blue chests below? One of those chests have something in it called a uh, combo counter. In the early Tales of the game, the combo counter would net you bonus experience if you racked up whatever your max combo was for each battle. Now, 
I'm gonna go ahead and tell you right now. The combo counter in this game is absolutely overpowered. Now coming up, I will sh oops, I got out too early. Still one more thing I gotta do. Like I said, got a little ahead of myself there. But anyway, the combo counter is very overpowered in this game because one of the things that it does is when you reach really, really high numbers with the max combos, it can really net you a crazy amount of experience. So let me go and put a little perspective here. The next battle I'm going to do, I'm going to do a 99 hit combo using Mary's Beast Blade since it has, you know, pops them up in the air. Perfect for juggling. So I'm going to give her a liquor bottle so she does very, very little damage to the enemies there. And after netting a 99 hit combo and winning the fight, it'll net me 70,000 experience. This will boost everybody's party, uh, everybody in the party's level to about 22 to 23. And that won't be the only time I'll do it. I do it a second time, but it's a lot easier than this one. So for this reason, I save here because this is a very, very important part of the run and I have to nail this. If I don't, I'll just reload the save. It's not something I can afford to mess up. But trust me, in the end, it's very, very worth it. Not only for boosted HP and TP, but the skills I get in the process are definitely worth it. So I'm going to focus for this part. Another thing I do before the fight is I do a little bit of a uh, changing of equipment. Okay, so first of all, Philly goes in the party instead of Ruti. I give Stun and um, Mary the short sword since it's a very, very uh, weak weapon. But one of the things it also does is it has a little bit of an accuracy bonus to it. With this accuracy bonus, It'll ensure that the enemies here do not block. Because for some crazy reason, even though they're in hit stun and they're popped into the air, they can actually block in mid-air. And that would cancel the combo completely. So what I'm going to try to do here is knock these bats both down. They're both weak to lightning. So, I can take full advantage of using E-Bolt bullets here. I'm going to make sure I'm locking onto the sorcerers here. Alright, now, I'm going to order them to stand still and not attack, and I'm going to take care of this priestess over here by myself. So that monk soldier is going to be the enemy I'm going to juggle. Now I need to make sure that he takes as little damage as possible before I kill this priestess. Because he has to survive all these hits Mary is going to hit on him. So as you can tell, I'm pretty under leveled at this point. Alright, so now I'm going to give the Liquor Bottle to Mary. That will decrease her attack by 20%. So now, we need to push him over to the right side of the screen. For some strange reason, it's a lot harder to do this on the left side. So I'm a lot more comfortable in doing the right side. So let me tell you one thing about this. For some strange reason, there's a really, really small chance that this guy is impossible to combo. There's some strange little variable in which he will drop lower than usual. And the second part of Mary's Beast Blade will miss. Ensuring that it's impossible to get 99 hits on him. Seems to be going pretty swell so far. Now I have to watch Mary's TP here as well. As soon as it hits the red, that's usually when I want to use an orange gel on here.
Oh, and to prove that I wasn't um, telling tales about how much experience I'll get, I'll even show y'all the bonus experience after the fight's over. Alright, one more. Amphilia, use lightning. Alright, and there we go, 99 hits. Here you go. There you go, 70,827. So everybody just got a massive, massive boost in levels. <laughs> Alright, so, now, let's fit everybody out. Give Dymos back to Stawn. Keep that. Give her the Night Saber. Alright, everybody should be good. Now, since all those levels just happened, everybody's uh, TP and HP is actually pretty low. So I actually like to use a little bit of my gels here for that. Alright. Now, there's a couple more priest fights in this area. It's not all over yet. But they'll be a lot easier now. So, after all of that, with that juggling and all that mess, here are the perks. So, as you can see, Stan has a lot of moves now. I have Tiger Blade, Force, which is actually Beast, Missile Sword, Spin Slash. But here's the important part. We have Thunder Blade already. So that's what we're going to use to get rid of them. Now, the problem is, there's two priests and they usually cast really quick before uh, she can get Thunderblade off. For some reason, Acid Rain causes hit stun, so it actually knocks her out of her animation of casting it. And there we go. Destruction. Look at the damage. 1,000 each. Alright. And there are two more fights, but they're exactly laid out like that, so... Same strat as before. <clears throat> wow. She... Deep Mist on Philia. It's like she knew what was coming. Alright, she got it off. Perfect. This will be a faster fight now. Alright, nice. Oh, and another thing I should mention. All that experience gained also goes to the Sordians as well, so their attack power is also increased on top of getting uh, new spells. Alright, so that's one of the tougher parts actually down. The mystic symbol in the warehouse in my older route I actually did get the mystic symbol because it my old route went more on the uh, use of the aura disc for the Sordians so you can get uh, higher level spells without actually having to level up and I spam those but then I was thinking all oh, this animation time's got to be slow so I got to think of something else and I came up with this so that obsoleted getting the mystic symbol I would possibly get it but I think that one involves a time limit with the boxes. So you could actually fail getting that. I also used to get Luna in that warehouse as well. Because she did a lot of damage and the next boss fight up ahead was actually pretty tough for me. But I don't need those anymore.
Yeah, I think this is uh, Sakuraba's one of his better works for the Tales of series. I liked his early works in the series. <laughs> Yeah, this is all normal. Unfortunately, you can't play on a harder difficulty on this. Unless there's a secret difficulty I don't know about. Alright, so we're going to stop by another warehouse before we go any farther. Alright, so in this warehouse we're going to get Sylph. But not only that, there's another solution to this warehouse we're going to do. This other solution is going to give me wing boots. Now, unlike most solutions in warehouses, when you do them once, you can't get it again. But for the wing boots, you can get as many as you like. So that was for Sylph. And the solution for the wing boots is putting three boxes in front of this back door. Alright. So we're taking off. Now this part is going to have me go through a bunch of battleships. And each battleship will have a bunch of enemies running around. If they touch me, they can initiate an encounter with me. There's some of these uh, rooms that are very, very narrow in size and they stuff two enemies in there, so it's kind of hard to get through without getting put into at least one battle. Now, it's not all bad if I get into a battle because there's an enemy called a Berserker on one of the uh, battleships and killing it gives me a small chance, but there's a chance for a drop rate for a flare bottle. Alright, that chest right there had a B sword in there, which actually stands for Bastard Sword. I usually run away from this guy. If he does initiate a battle, I just go back up and then back straight down where he can't reach me. Usually he passes by me, but I'd rather not give him the time. <sighs> Ooh. See, that was one of the narrow rooms I spoke of before. Now you think some of them actually track towards your general direction. Sometimes that's true, but at other times they kind of switch it up on you and just move at a random direction. So it can be kind of hard to sort of predict their movements. Sometimes one of the pirates lives. At least from one Thunder Blade. But just one hit from anybody will take him out. I love how he looks like a priest on the overworld, but when you get into battle, it's a bunch of pirates. Ooh, that was actually out of the range. Alright. Yeah, but there actually is an actual hit radius with Thunderblade. So you can't just use it. Oh, he got me. You can't just use it everywhere and then expect it to hit everything on screen. Oh, okay, that was strange. He sort of moved in a diagonal direction. I've seen that before, though. It's nothing new to me. 
I'm gonna try to juke him here. If he doesn't move... Yeah, I'm gonna have to kill him. Not a big deal. Let's see if I at least get a flare bottle for my troubles. Nope. The drop rate for a flare bottle is not very high, so I don't expect it too often. Wow. There's a couple of these rooms, actually, where it could put you in a situation where they actually get a chance to initiate a battle, but they can actually touch you and not start one, which is very strange. Wow. See what I mean, though? Like, he just... Usually that guy just moves all the way down, but... See, this guy had different plans. And I guess Philly just wants to use Tractor Beam before we run away. Wow! Look at this guy! He will not go away. Alright, I'm gonna back up a little bit, see what he does. Alright, there we go. This will more than likely miss everybody else. Oh no, it caught the pirate in the back. Oh no. These aren't the run destroyers. There's things later that's more of a run destroyer than this. Alright. This is actually the big boss's ship, so... This one's gonna be a little bit longer. Oh. I think I can get away from this one, because I have an open lane ahead. See, that's one of the situations I was talking about. He touched me, but he didn't start a battle. But this guy to the left of him did. I'm getting caught by nearly everybody here. I usually expect that first guy to catch me, though. Alright, this is where the boss is. Alright, this is the first, what I like to call the first real boss of the game. You see as the different music is playing. Now, this boss has a little bit more HP on him, but this is the first boss I actually use a summon spirit for. So, you'll see some F-Freak. They look a little uh, different than they do in other games. <laughs> Alright. Alright. And he's out! Oh, nice! Now, after the first uh, 99 hit combo, Leon received a move called Dragon Blade. That is probably the most useful skill in the entire game. And I will be spamming a lot of that for as long as Leon is in the party. So, uh, after the second 99 hit that I will be doing, Stom will get the move too. But as of right now, Leon is very, very good because he gets it earlier than Stan does. The PS2 version of this... Whew, I don't know what they did. Like, some of the um, arrangements they did on the PS2 version, I was, I were not feeling those at all. <laughs> it's like, what did y'all do to this? Alright, so... This is what I like to call one of the comfier times of the run. Okay, so... Eileen's gonna take Stan out on a date and show him around town. Ruti over here is getting jealous, so they'll be stalking them and watching them the entire time. But it's just a bunch of dialogue and it's a lot of... 
kind of slows down the pace of the run here. I usually tell people if there's anything you want to go do, like use the bathroom or go get some food, this is one of the better moments to do it. Another good moment is uh, after you beat the final boss of the first half of the game, you get a fake ending. And that lasts for about a good minute and a half. I can't make it go faster either because the uh, dialogue runs automatically. The arrows on the ground, I believe, are for the Mock Boy race. That's an optional mini game you can play. And Bison, don't remind me of the final rank Coliseum fight with Leon. That was so stupid. I don't, I don't know what they were thinking with that. They literally throw at you every boss in the game. And I thought it would end after uh, the final boss, but then they just started throwing more. And then eventually, Barbado shows up and I'm just, nah, I was done. And I was cheating that. I was using uh, Demon Lance Zero, and that's the most overpowered move in the game, by far. But when I got to that part, I was just done. I had enough. Alright, so she's going to show me the arena here, but the champion of the arena doesn't really like the whole idea of bringing me here and not wanting to fight him. So he's going to throw some insults, and then Stan's going to get upset and throw some insults back, and then it ends up being a fight. Now, despite me having getting all these levels off of the 99 hit combo, I still lose this fight. This is one of the fights they expect you to lose as well. Now here's a little fun fact. If you do in fact win this fight, Kang will actually join your party. But here's the thing. As soon as you leave the island, Kang goes right back to the arena. So there's really no reason to win this fight. It's actually slower to do so. So you have him temporarily, you really can't do anything with him because if you progress in the story he just says, oh, well I'm not leaving this island because I'm, I don't know, I'm like the ch protector of this island. He says something stupid. He gives you some dumb excuse for not wanting to stay in the party. After you're done with the first half of the game and you go back to the arena and fight him again, then you beat him, then he'll stay permanently. But for some reason, he does not want to stay in your party when you leave. Now, I can make it to where I can win that fight. If I were to buy 15 E-Bullets before the fight, 15 E-Bullets is just enough to whittle his HP down. Not to uh, death, but very, very close to where it'd be only like 2 or 3 hits from stun to take him out. Yeah, there's a lot of optional characters in the game. There's only uh, six party member slots. 
and when you get to the second half you only have four characters so you have two slots to use on optional characters most of them are really easy to get some you have to do a little something before getting them nah I'm actually gonna get an optional character in this run I won't reveal who just yet But there is one I will get. I guarantee you that. When I first unlocked Lilith, I didn't even use her. But when I got to the Arcana Ruin, I soon realized how useful she really can be. Because a lot of her attacks have a wide assortment of, uh, I don't even know if I can call them elements, but like smash, slash, and stuff like that. She can use pretty much all of them. So just about any weakness in the Arcana Ruin, she'll have one move for it. And I was wondering for the longest time, why does she have the least amount of uses compared to other characters? And that's the reason why. It's one of the rare times you see a Tales of character actually swimming. Alright, so Batista got away and now we gotta find out where he's at. That's what we're talking to these folks for. You actually have to talk to them because if you don't, the cave coming up next does not open up. There's a tide blocking it. Alright, so we're going to do a little bit of switching here. Alright, so. We're going to equip Mary with the Bastard Sword. We're going to take out Philia for this part. Oh yeah, in the Japanese version of this game, if you did a certain sequence of... What do I even call them? Events? Well, if you follow this guide, you can actually unlock uh, Lilith's uh, Stan's sister Lilith. She was originally supposed to be an optional character, but she was dummied out of the game because they did not finish her, I guess, finish her moves or whatever. I never really used her myself, but I heard she was actually worth using. This place isn't very long. Now for those of you who played the PS2 version, the boss of this place will look familiar in a way. But they did a little bit of design changes, I'll just say that. What's up, Kamachi? Now this isn't the cave head, it's called the Orgus Queen in this game. Alright, I don't have Dragon. I don't know why I thought I did. I need to take care of her little babies first. This boss is actually weak against fire. So once I get over to the main queen, she's gonna take some extra damage.
All right. Good fight. The PS2 version of this fight. Who? I hated that fight. There's a lot of monsters in that cave in the PS2 version that inflict paralyze. So that place was very annoying for me because I did not want to equip some anti-paralysis gear on. Because I was too attached to the ones I had. Alright, so Stan is going to intervene here with these soldiers mistreating these villagers. And these guys are easy. These are the same soldiers from the beginning of the game. No joke. They will fold like a deck of cards. <laughs> As you can see. And then it causes trouble, so now we gotta run away. I will play the song of my people. I think this is the only time in the game where the character you control as your avatar over the overworld is someone other than Stan. You can't actually switch him in this game, so. Other than this part. I love his running animation, by the way. Oh, is he useful in the original? I'll uh, let you find that out soon. He's not a uh, Rondo overpowered, but I say he's good in his own right. Rondo is just a crazy good move. There's a good reason they don't give you that move until you level him to a crazy number. Then you have to be in like the 100s or something for that. Or close to 100. Alright, so... For our new party member, Carol, they call him in this game, um, he only has one skill, and his only skill right now is Symphony, and it increases the hit rate of everybody in the party. That's actually a very good uh, skill for the beginning of this area. When we get to the next boss, we're going to be using that because hit rate might not seem very useful, but in a game like Tales of Destiny, there's a lot of enemies that have high evade. So with their high evade, that means their chances of auto-blocking is very, very high. So when we use something like uh, Symphony, it'll decreases, decrease those chances by... I'm, I'm, well, I almost want to say they never block it while it's in effect. It is a temporary use though, but if you keep using it before it wears out, it'll never go away. So yes, we will be using him soon. Now, in that chest, what I just got was an item called Score. For him to get any more skills other than what he has, he doesn't get it by leveling up. You have to go find these items called Scores. And for each of them, it gives him a new skill that he can use. The one that I get from that one is Samba. It's one of his attacking skills. Now, Symphony does not attack. It's just a support skill. So... By giving him Samba, it gives him a skill that he can actually attack with. Whoop. I need to move over to the other menu. Holy Ball is starting to get too low. Now I'm going to take a chance here. Rudy actually has a move called uh, Escape. It's luck-based, 
But if you get in the first three attempts, it'll actually be faster than escaping normally. Which did not happen, so let me just do it normally. Sometimes I get really, really lucky with this and get it like in the first few attempts, but I'm not gonna try my luck too much. Alright, so we push the blocks back in the uh, places they're supposed to be and turn the water back on. Now you have to actually turn the water back on because the gates you have to go through are actually uh, powered by the water. So if you have them turned off, they actually lock up. Man, these characters love to do this. Use a spell and run away. But anyway. I usually turn her offensive spells off at this point, but I'm gonna wait until uh, after the next one because she gets another set of offensive spells, so I have to go into the menu twice to turn more skills off. Alright, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, bring up that the boss of this area actually is the second time that I do a 99 hit combo. I like to call this one a lot easier. Because it actually doesn't involve juggling. It involves using a different move. I won't reveal what that move is just yet. But Mary is going to play another huge role here. Alright, so, another little hidden thing about uh, leveling up Philia after the 90 high hit combo, she actually gains a skill called Cloak that actually works just like a Holy Bottle. So, even though I'm out of Holy Bottles, I can just keep using Cloak with Philia. It uses 33 TP each time though, so it's pretty hefty on the TP, but she has a lot at this point, so it's not that big of a deal. Alright, for this part, he's going to have to play the piano, and he's going to ask someone to stay in case uh, monsters appear. I'm going to leave Philia with them. Alright, this puzzle up here, this is some crazy little sound puzzle. It plays a voice clip every time you press a button. When you go up to the door, it tells you what the sounds you need to play in order. But it's really easy to remember. If you're into sports, think of it as a uh, seedings in the playoffs. 1, 8, 2, 7, 3, 6, 4, 5. Real easy to remember. Alright, so that's it. And we got a valve for one of the drains here because later on there's going to be one without any valve on it. This next one won't have it but the one after it will. Also I need to mention that puzzle over there, I sort of wait a little bit before I move because even though the voice clip is playing, it won't let you move until it's over. And even though it sounds like it's over, there's still like a split second or so where it'll freeze you in place. So if you actually mess that up, you have to do the entire puzzle again if you hit another switch out of order. So I do that just to ensure that I don't mess it up. Yeah, this game's a little weird when it comes to items. Like, uh, I'll explain some. Dark Bottles are considered rare. You can only get them out of chests. You cannot buy Dark Bottles in this game. Dark Bottles just increase your uh, encounter rate so you can get uh, more encounters. I don't know why something like that would be rare. Flare Bottles are rare. You can't buy those. You only get those from chests as well and uh, enemy drops. There are also some food in this game. Since this game has the food sack and it doesn't have the cooking system that uh, later games have, some types of food also have uh, effects of holy bottles and dark bottles. If you want a joke here, there's a food called wormy apple. It's an apple with a bunch of holes in it that a worm ate through. 
If you eat that apple, it'll give you a holy bobble effect. And I am not kidding. There's also some food that inflicts status effects such as poison. A barracuda will do that. Uh, what's another one? Oh, a blowfish will do that too. Alright, I'm gonna save here because this is another important part of the run. Boss is coming up. Alright, gonna have to do a little more arranging of the party here. Alright, gonna put him in. We're gonna re equip the short swords. Alright, Stan is actually gonna play a role in this next one. Gonna make sure the. Yeah, I left the combo display on. I shouldn't have did that because it makes some of the uh, battles after you complete them a little bit slower, but. It's better than forgetting to turn it on. I've done that before, by the way, and it's not a good feeling. Okay, so he's got some small fries with him, but this is why we have Sylph. They'll all be wiped out. Alright, so start off with a Symphony. That'll prevent him from blocking. So now, we're going to use Force. And I also need to tell them not to do anything. Alright, so... I'm going to sort of roll back and forth using this to rack up 99 hits. But I have to make sure Symphony does not drop like it just did there. At any moment when Symphony is dropped and is not in effect, Batista can block and ending the combo. Another thing I have to watch is their TP because Force takes quite a bit. Should be enough. Yep, we got it. 99 hits. Alright, so now I'm gonna spam Samba. Try to keep him in the corner because he loves to shuffle around a lot. Give him some TP back. He loves to use Hyper Beam, if you haven't noticed. You shouldn't have much HP at this point. But since we're using short swords, we're not going to do a lot of damage here. One, two, three. Oh, out of TP. Alright, there we go. He's out. No, this is actually the last game without shortcuts. The very next Tales of Game had shortcuts in it. Alright, so we got another 70,000 experience. Now this will put everybody in the 30-ish uh, area. So now, this is just high enough for Stan to have Dragon Blade. So now, both Leon and Stan have Dragon Blade. Now this is where things get really ridiculous. If you surround a boss and have them both use Dragon Blade sort of in a rhythm to where... Uh, not where they both use it at the same time, but one uses it a little before the other you can really put a boss in a really bad situation since you both are slashing constantly they cannot get out there are a couple of bosses actually even while a hit stun they can use a move and try to get out there's actually a couple of them coming up and they can be a real pain because of that oh yes yeah, Asteria took them out I never understood why they did that. <laughs> I 
They changed. They did a lot of weird mechanic changes in that game. So many that I don't even remember them all. And I never did. Okay, so. This next boss is going to be weak against fire. You can probably already guess who he is. Oh. Almost forgot to equip Donald's back. So, the Night Saber is actually fire based. So, with Night Saber and Daimos on our side, plus uh, Symphony by yours truly, we will not have to worry about him trying to do anything suspicious. Now, this boss can be dangerous since this boss can actually cast. Um, oops, that's the wrong character. This boss can actually cast. Tidal Wave at this point, and that's a high level water move. That will shred the party's HP if you don't watch it. He usually tries to do it at the very, very beginning, too, but at this point, there's nothing he can do here. And there you go. There's your Kraken. Easy. wasn't scrolling for some reason <clears throat> all right so for this one this boat's a little bit different you actually have to tell them what direction you want to go so what you got to do first is you got to open up the gate before you can get inside but it's not hard to remember which one of these takes you to the room with the lever to open the gate it's right here all right so now the gate's open, we can go inside Castle Tarazi now. Currently no one runs uh, Tales of Legend India. We do have an Abyss runner, but I've heard Legendia is longer than Abyss. And I haven't even played it before. Alright. So here we are. Castle Tarazi. Now this place is actually extremely short. There's only two puzzles you really have to do here. One involves... Um, Zodiac signs just like in the PS2 version it's the same looking room and everything now what's crazy is if you play the Japanese version it'll actually have to deal with a uh, not Zodiac signs but the things like the Chinese you know like year of the monkey year of the horse yeah you gotta deal with that there's less of them too than there are Zodiac signs but there's a certain order you have to go through the doors. And after figuring them out right, you get the progress. And the boss is right beyond that puzzle. So right now, this thing right here drains the water. And this room right next to it has this plant I have to throw down a hole. And I have to put that plant on a switch. Yeah, that's something that I'd have to look at. I still have to go grab the 3DS version. I'll look at that when I get it. Alright, so they're a little sneaky. There's actually some secret treasure chests down here. Three of them. In these three chests, there's an elixir, an hourglass, and Efri. <gasps> Another summon item. Whoops. That was weird. <laughs> it looked like I turned around. That was really strange. It looked like I turned around, but he still grabbed it. Alright, so... For this, 
goat, water jug, fish, ram, bull, twins, crab, lion, Virgin. Whoop. Mislocated the scales. Scorpion and the bow and arrow. There are no encounters in here, thankfully. Alright, so we're gonna make another adjustment here. We're gonna take Leon out for Ruti. Now, Ruti actually plays a pretty important role here as well. The next boss is Tiberius. He could be sort of a pain, but he's actually pretty weak compared to other bosses. He's actually weak against every element in the game and only has 10,000 HP. So his strength point is actually his evade. His evade is crazy high and he will block just about anything you throw at him. So let's get rid of his little lackeys first. Yeah, he loves doing that. Alright, so now... What I'm gonna have to do... I'm gonna have Ruti steal his sword. You actually cannot get this otherwise. He will never drop it if you kill him. So, I'm gonna sit here... And when Ruti steals it... She'll jump back with a bag in her hand. And that's a sword. There we go. We got it. Alright, now we can take him out. Alright. Now he's out. Now that item I got, Sheeton, that's his sword. Let me tell you about this weapon right here. This sword is amazing. It's earth element. It has really good attack power on it for this point in the game. But most importantly, the most important thing about it is its hit. Its hit bonus is 100. With a bonus that high, there is almost nothing in this game that could block any move that you throw at it. No matter high, how high their evade is. And we give the sheet to uh, Leon. We let him have that. Alright, so we get out of here with wing boots. That's what wing boots do in this game, by the way. They let you leave uh, any dungeon instantly. It's kind of like an escape rope in Pokemon. Now, there is a backup to it. If I do kill Tiberius on accident, there are actually a warehouse here with a certain box solution that actually gives you another sheeting. So I could have two right now if I wanted to, but I won't be needing that. So we can go ahead and leave this place. Alright, so we're gonna head over to Fandaria. And this place is really, really cold. And there's actually a forest we're gonna go into later that actually hurts you if you take steps in it without equipping a fur coat. Or a fur cape, I mean. So, I could buy four of them, one for every party member, but I don't really see much reason in doing that since just giving it the stun will prevent a game over. Now, if you don't equip anybody with a fur cape going into that place, and you walk too much, you can get a game over. So it's very important that you remember to buy fur capes and equip them.
All right, we're gonna head on. Yeah, Mattel has the copyright on uh, Eternia because of He-Man. They wanted to dodge any possible lawsuits. I don't blame them for it. You never know it these days. I'm gonna grab a couple pee bottles here. Because later on in the run, there's gonna be quite a few monsters who might uh, put stone or something like that. Alright, another thing I need to do before I forget. That's real important. Alright, so Gar's in a little bit of a pickle here, so we need to save him. This fight right here is pretty easy as well. Not really much to say about it. Oh. I don't know why a crow is with them. That one always confused me. So we can go ahead and head out. Now that's the noise that it makes when you walk through here without the fur coat. But Stan has one, so we get to live. And as you can see, everybody's just asleep right now. That cold is a little too intense for him. Alright, so now, after that cutscene, Gar gave us Sorcerer's Ring. Now, the Sorcerer's Ring, just like in any other tales, it shoots a projectile in front of you. In this game, it uses up Lens. Lens is not really something that you have to worry about in this game because you never ever use it. But when you're playing casually, you can go to uh, Lens shops and you can sell them for money. For a flat rate. Whoa. Look, they're not dead, they're just sleeping. Eternal slumber. Alright, so... It's time for yet another boss. This one also isn't too, um... There's not much to say about it. There's a... Uh, what I want to say, there's two bow users behind you. There's the main boss in front of you and another bow user. So... Leon's gonna be in the back of the party with his newly equipped sheet and he's gonna slice through them. And me, I'm gonna use Spin Slash to go over the boss and to be on the right of him. So when Leon is done and he joins up from the left side, we're going to sandwich the boss and spam Dragon Blade until he dies. Now, this is another boss who also has high evade, so he's gonna be blocking a lot of my moves at first. Oh, uh, let's see. No, party's good. I thought I had to do a party switch. This chest has a flare bottle, so I grabbed that. And also, I'm going to use a flare bottle on Leon. That's another thing. I would have loved them to make like a PSP uh, remake of Destiny, kind of like how they did with a uh, cross edition Fantasia. Since they already did the uh, completely revamp the game and the battle system, and everything with the PS2 version, but I like to see it like just a more advanced version of this, in the same graphics and same style.
Real talk though, I think Eternia, if any game should get a remake, Eternia should try to get one. I don't know how they feel about that though. Alright, Flare Bottle Leon. It's gonna Dragon Blade these fools over here. Leon get on this side. What are you? Oh no. Also, this is one of the bosses who actually can use a move while you're hit stunning him. And that's the move. But this is why we sandwich him. He loves to use this move. It also has a high rate of stunning. Which Leon just got stunned. But that's no problem. A 3D over a 2D? Really? Hmm. I don't know about that. Now this part's a little bit interesting. Okay, so Mary's gonna leave the party after these cutscenes. She's gonna be gone. So, for you casual players, she is an optional character to get back in the party later. But you have to do something special in order for this to happen. And I don't expect no one, unless they look up a guide, to know how to do this. So before I came to this area, when you go out of that forest, you can go a little more south and there's another town you can go to. If you go into a certain house, a cutscene will play and Mary will regain more of her memories. After that cutscene plays, you then go back over to here, then fight the boss. And then you can get her back later. Makes no sense. In the PS2 version, you don't have to worry about doing that. She comes back anyway. Alright, there's this little mini boss after I slide across here that I'm gonna get into. This guy is absolutely laughable. He's weak against fire, so. He won't be able to do a thing. Poor Ice Golem. The guy was dead on arrival. And that's another thing. If you step in front of uh, your party and it's out of formation, they can sort of get stuck and try to move back and forth really, really quickly to try to uh, fix their formation. And they won't do any actions until it's fixed. So if you see them like standing there and they're like blurring up a little bit, that's what they're trying to do. And all you need to do is just simply move a little bit to the left or right and they fix up. Lighting all those torches will open up this door. This door is locked otherwise. The other door takes you to a room with a lone treasure chest that has a jewel. Not very useful. Now, this is one of the places I was talking about earlier that a status effect can uh, happen to a party member. The zombies here, if they hit you, they can sometimes paralyze you. And that's annoying to deal with if you don't have any way of curing it. And yes, when Gar comes back to the party, he's actually the same level that he was when you first met him at the beginning of the game. So, he's going to be very weak, but he actually still has use, believe it or not. He actually still has use. Hold up. Gotta grab this. It's a weapon for Gar. Okay, so... 
I'm gonna go ahead and uh, explain why Gar would actually be useful being low level. The AI for this game is very weird. Okay, so the formation usually has Stan in the front lines, everybody behind him. So even though you're fighting an enemy in front of you, most of them will just stand there and do nothing. They're programmed to attack once in their line of sight, there's an enemy in front of them. So if you use a move like Spin Slash, they'll try to actually run after the enemy and attack, if they're a physical attacker. But if they have a ranged attack such as Magic or a Bow, they will attack no matter where they are. So for this reason, Gar would have uh, his Bow AI in place for this part. And I wouldn't have to keep trying to go to the menus and trying to order him to do a certain move. He'd sort of do his own thing. So that's one of the reasons why I think Gar would be very, very useful. Now, he is weak for this upcoming boss fight. He can die real easy, but he'll be in the back of the formation. So the only way he should die is if the boss hits him with a lot of spells. And I need to equip him with the Hunter's Bow. Gotta melt that. Melting that will allow you to pull this lever up here. And this one. These will open two curtains and open up the way to the next boss. Alright, so we take Philia out for this next part, if you're wondering who isn't in the party for this next part of the game. Now I'm going to do this without a summon spirit, so this is kind of risky, considering what kind of spells this guy has. This guy has Cyclone on him, which is the highest level of wind spell, so... This could get ugly. Okay, luckily he didn't do it. I'm gonna have Ruti give me a green gel here. Alright. Alright, perfect. We got him sandwiched and everything. Flare bottle me up, bro. Alright, that's why this guy is a pain. He can jump at any time to get out of your sandwich. So, going to have to take it easy here. Alright. He also has a move. Yep, there it is. That move right there is painful. Very painful. Alright, this guy's actually giving me a fight. Usually he's not much, but... He is definitely not making this an easy fight for me. Boy, he's used that move quite a bit. Come on now. Play nice. Take a nap. Take a nap. Alright, there you go. This guy has a lot of HP on him. Alright, so, believe it or not, that's the final boss of the first half of the game. So now, there's going to be a fake ending coming up.
That guy was the quote unquote final boss. So yeah, I did that under two hours, so I think I'm on a really good pace here. Usually around under 150, but I'll take this. To top the timer to the credits, no, nah, I don't do that. I stopped the timer on the fade out of the final boss. So once you beat the game or beat the final boss and the screen fades to black, that's when I stopped my timer. I feel like that's a way more consistent time to stop your timer rather than doing it when the boss is blowing up or the results screen or something like that. Because as soon as you see it fade to black, boom, it gives you enough time to have your hand ready on the split button and everything. Oh yeah, this, this part kind of makes me mad. So, I don't remember in the PS2 if he does this or not, but during this cutscene with Ruti, he gives all of his money that he currently holds to her. Yes, just because it happens in the cutscene doesn't mean um, that you might think, well, no, it won't happen to me. No, when you go back after this cutscene, you are dead broke, flat goose egg next to the gal. So you have to get all of your money back somehow. So, uh, luckily for me, I don't have to use the combo counter anymore. The combo counter sells for 33,000 gal at the shop. So once I get back and make my first shopping trip, I can sell that and have more than I've ever had before. The PS2 remake is a uh, 2D. Man, after you told me that he wants a 3D remake, I don't know what to expect out of that. Either that can be executed very well or go very horribly. Like, would they inherit Grace's battle system or something? Zillia? And I haven't even played those games, so I don't even know what I'm saying. They, I just know those games have CC in them. But yeah, I'm not touching my controller. This is all automated, so I can't make this go any faster. I thought Zestiria was alright. I wouldn't recommend it to somebody as a introduction to the series though. I'd rather show them like, go play Symphonia or something. It's on PC and everything. Which by the way, they just had an update on Symphonia PC not too long ago. They add, finally added 100 slots to the game. Before then there was only 6. So I'm glad they did that. Yeah, I like to tell people of Symphonia though because I don't expect everybody to have a PS2. Who's the better archer? Well, if we're talking about pure archer, Chelsea's actually better because she gets better, uh, she gets more uh, archer skills for it. Gar is more of a variety type character. He can use a lot of different weapons. In this game, I, 
He can use swords, lances, bows. He can also use his swordian to cast spells as well. Like if I remember correctly, I read something that said Gar is still the most versatile character in the Tales of series. There's no other character who can use more weapons and more forms of attacking than Gar. <clears throat> so that's good to know. Alright, so, if you look real closely, you can kind of get an idea who's talking here, even though it has question marks. Like, if you look at the sprites from the past, you're like, wait, is that? Yeah, it's them. The thing is, though, when you go for optional characters, whatever level they were after you last had them, they'll still have that level. So if I go back for Chelsea, for example, that level she had when I had her at the beginning of the game, she'll have that when I get her back in the party. How much more save time is possible? Not sure. All right, so Stan is back home doesn't have any weapons, doesn't have any money. So, he wakes up one morning, eats some breakfast, and Lilith says, all right, so, go buy me some fish from the market. I don't know how Stan's gonna buy any, seeing that he's broke. So, you go to the fish market, he's like, well, we got fish, but they don't look too good. So, I'll give you a little history lesson with me in this game. At first, I thought you had to go over to this pond over here, steal a fish, and if you're lucky enough, you can actually take a fish and bring it back to Lilith. If you do that, she gets really upset with you and tells you to go put it back. Because the game progressed after you did that. But, you don't have to do that. You can just go back to Lilith's house and talk to her, and then there you go. You just tell her, well, there ain't no good fish. Alright, you can't do anything about that. So for the longest time, I seriously thought this part of the game was luck based. Because when you try to attempt to catch a fish, if you fail to catch it, it disappears from the pond. And it's actually luck based whether you get the fish or not. So if you fail to get every fish in the pond, you have to go back into a house and back out to respawn the fish. Alright, so we're going to talk to the mayor's daughter over here. And you tell her there's another girl you like, and she gives you magic mist. Depending on what answer you give your, uh, you give to her, she'll give you uh, a different item. One of them she gives you 15 miracle gels. One she gives you magic mist, and the other she gives you black onyx. But magic mist is the most important thing you want here. Now with the magic mist, we're gonna be running away from these enemy fights a lot faster now. That thing is going to. Uh, the gauge is going to deplete way faster now, is what I meant to say. You can see an example here. <clears throat> I'll let the uh, game do the talking. And we're out of here. Yes, it's crazy, but for some reason the mayor's daughter has 15 miracle gels and she'll give you that many if you pick the... Uh, right one. I forgot which one it is. I think it's the first one. And I think the third one gives you Black Onyx. Black Onyx is good and all, but running away from what seems like an endless barrage of enemies. Oh, I keep forgetting this is Oberon Corporation ship. You have to go to this one. Alright, so now we have to go get the party back. So first we're going to go get Gar and then we're going to get Ruti back. Gar is back in his kingdom of Fundaria, so unlike last time, we don't have to go to the forest to go get him. We can actually take a shortcut through this uh, smaller forest. Oh, 
Oh, you like my commentary? Thanks, dude. Well, at this point, um, something happens when it is thought that, you know, your journey's over. Philia comes back and informs you that there's bad news. You don't know what the news is exactly, besides that the Eye of Atamani got taken. So, she informs you that you need to go get everybody back and then report back to the king. And then he'll tell you the full story there. You'll, uh... You'll kind of get an idea of where this is going. Well, they tell you to go get them back because they're sorting end users and it, they feel that you must have them. I really wouldn't mind having them because, you know, you don't have six characters at this point. All right, so this is where I do my shopping trip. This will be the last one I do in the game as well. Alright, so it's combo counter. Oh, it's 31,000. I was close. But anyway, I'll stock up on healing items here. 15 of everything. Wait. Oh, yeah. I, I was like, wait, where's Holy Balls? But I'm like, oh, I'm stupid. That's right. I don't need Holy Balls. I have Cloak. <laughs> I'm too used to buying Holy Balls in every single shop I go to. Uh, Eternia doesn't have a false ending. Unless you count going to Belir Castle as a false ending. When you go there, you lose to the final boss, so you already figured that it's not over. Alright, so we got Gar. We can leave this place. Cut through this forest again. It's really strange how this forest doesn't hurt you if you don't have a fur coat. But the forest farther up north will. Like both places are snowing. And it doesn't look too different. Is that that much of a temperature difference? Yeah, I'm playing this on a 90,001 uh, PS2. Which is a PS2 slim. You can get a uh, Carol back. You can't go and get optional characters until a certain point in the second half. I'll bring that up when I get to that point. Because I do and I do go to get an optional character. I just haven't said which one yet. Yeah, once you have six, they won't let you get any more characters. So once you have your original four, you have to decide on who your two optionals will be for the rest of the game. Alright, so we gotta go over to Cresta. If I try to go to the king right now, Philia will stop me. So, I have to go get her. I enter the village from the left side because that's a lot closer to where she is. And surprise, Ruthie actually runs an orphanage. 
No wonder she, she was stealing stuff. And so money hungry. I don't know about the ship. The ships are automatic. You don't control a ship in this game. Later, you get a sea dragon to travel on. And actually, that's going to come real soon. Once I go back to Rattastraw, but got to talk to the king first. Alright, so first, we gotta go back to Hugo's mansion, do some investigating. He's gone missing. So we go over the back here, and in this room there's a book that wasn't there before. And it gives a hint to where his whereabouts are. So now we gotta talk to the leader of the investigation team. And you can tell it's him because he has a beard and mustache, this guy right here. Otherwise they all look the same. Alright, so now you go tell the king about your new findings. How am I running so fast? This is actually the normal run speed. I'm not doing anything extra to it. Alright, there we go head off on the ship. Fantasia PS1, I don't know. I think the running speeds are about the same, but I think Destiny's is a little faster. Whoops. I always make this mistake. Like, this part, for some reason, that's just muscle memory taking over. Sometimes I come back and try to play this casually, but I think it hurts me more than helps me when it comes to speedrunning games. Like, wait, no, don't go the way to beat this way fast. Play it normally. I don't want to do that. So, the password here is blue metallic blue. So, once you do that, you'll open up this door into a uh, Oberon Corporation employee. So, we're going to give uh, Philia Demlos here. Now, Philia is going to be a little bit different here. We're not going to be relying too much on spells like before. Now at first, that dog in the back could cast Thunderblade. If you notice him sort of crouching down and charging up, that's what he was going to cast. He's at the very back of all these enemies, so it can be pretty annoying if you can't hit him out of it. So, I'm going to go ahead and say that uh, if anybody likes uh, Philia Bomb, you're going to love this next stretch of the game because that's going to be Philia's bread and butter for about the rest of the game. So, by equipping uh, Dimlos to Philia, it increases her attack power because the Sorian is just way stronger than uh, Clemente is. When I get a certain aura disc, she becomes really, really strong with their uh, Philia bombs. And it's a lot better to just spam that for their uh, raw attack power. Alright, got him.
There's a lot more to this place, but it's mostly just uh, treasure. Nothing that I need. Oops. The password to input. Oh, I'm talking to somebody else. There are passwords in this game, but uh, that's a little bit later. Destiny PS2 password. If you mean the one that give like the secret skills, I hate those. They thought two ahead for that. Like you can't use the same one every time. They're all randomized. And they expect you to go to their website to find out what the code was, but their website is long gone. The game came out in like 2006. So there's no way that site's gonna still be around. Alrighty, this is probably the most iconic moment and probably all of Tales. This fight right here. So Leon did betray the party. He was a part of the grand scheme all along. Too bad that the fight strategy is not really that interesting. If it goes right. Oh no, he got behind me. I can't sandwich him now. Well, guess I'll have to throw that away. And there we go. Alright, what I was trying to do initially, I usually use Spin Slash to get behind bosses who aren't that tall. To try to do a sandwich strat like most of the bosses I've done before. But if you push a boss too far to the right, at the end of the screen, it's impossible to get to them unless they move far enough to the left. So if that happens, I just spam Spin Slash and... Usually that does the trick. But yeah, it wasn't going to be too much different if I did get behind him. It would have been a Dragon Blade spam with a Twin Bomb. But Philia becomes a lot more useful and her damage output grows a lot more as the game goes on. Most importantly, after... Next boss? No, 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 no. Not the next boss. Actually, no, no, no. It is the next boss. Yeah, 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 yeah. Tales of Destiny 
director's cut was probably the biggest treat to Leon fans that the Tales of the Studio could have possibly ever done. I don't think they could have catered to their fans any more than that game has possibly done. Like, you made sure to make Leon someone important. Not to mention you gave him the most OP move in the game. It's after you beat the game, but still. Stupidly OP. Alright, so we're gonna have him take us to Rattlestraw now. How long is it without skipping all the dialogue? Uh, not sure. Do I speak Japanese? Not really. I can read some basic stuff, but nothing to write at home about. Just enough to get me by with uh, some Japanese RPGs with like menus and stuff. Don't worry, I haven't played Vesperia either. It's worse when so many people call it the best one. <laughs> so it makes you feel like you're missing out on something. But really, when it comes to these casual runs of playing the game, I don't know, I don't like, like giving people an estimate for it because it varies so much on how you play it yourself and you know I can't you know accurately predict how fast somebody would play through it like if you rather take it slow read the dialogue would you know where to go next you know a lot of that stuff comes into play so when I give them a wrong estimate, they can't come back and say, hey man, this game was a lot longer than you told me. But yeah, I gotta go get the mana helper first. There's a scientist back here that can help us with that. I feel like I gotta press harder on my controller to use some of these buttons now. Might be wearing down. There's an NPC behind that tree. Alright, so we can just use the horn out of our menu to uh, hop on the dragon now. <clears throat> so no more relying on boats. You can, however, talk to the guy to take him uh, to get you to take you back to Rata Straw if you forgot where it is. But the dragon is much faster, so there's no reason to do that. Alright, so now we got a Miss Helper. There's one more thing we have to do. There's a certain disc we gotta go get. So now we gotta go head over to this cave with the dragon first. 
All right, so I like to say at this point we can go get our optional character, but I like to wait after I get the disc before I go get them. So that's what I'm gonna do. little crescent part of the map over here. There's a little cave right here. Alright, so this area right here, there's actually a boss inside. But you can skip that boss completely if you have Stan put his swordian down. Now, what's real interesting about this, whichever swordian is equipped to Stan, they'll talk to him whenever he places it down. So, it's a real exclusive one-on-one -on -one dialogue with whatever sword you have equipped to him and Stan. And it's some of it is actually pretty interesting. So now we have the disc. So now I'm gonna go get my optional character. So have you taken a guess of who it is? Because the answer is about to get revealed right here. If you guess Carol, then you guess correctly. Now, later on is when he really becomes really, really, really helpful. It's not right now. But mostly the two skills that I have on him right now is all he needs, Symphony and Samba. Now when he gets his uh, stronger weapons later on, most notably the uh, guitar, which is at the final dungeon, that's when he starts racking off some real damage. Samba hits four times. He shoots four musical notes out at the enemy. All four of those times near the end of the game, it does about 300 each. That right there, my friend, is very useful. And it's spammable. And for the first form of the final boss, he likes to float around a lot, really, really high up to where you can't hit him. And Samba tracks. So it would knock him down if he tried it. Alright. What is Tales of Tempest? I never heard of that. Oh. Need to refill Phileas TP. Constant cloak usage. Alright, so first, I actually have to go to a place that I can't progress to first. Just for cutscene reasons. The game forces me to do it. I know exactly where to go to actually progress, but they want you to go to a warp room that got destroyed first. Because if you don't, 
a certain part of this area will be blocked off. So watching that cutscene will trigger that and open up where you need to go. And this is that room. Now the other work room looks exactly like this without an orange mess in it. So after seeing that, it makes you come all the way back over here. And now you can go the right way. Thankfully, after you drain the water, that shortcut's there, so you can quickly get out. Now, around this time when you're up in the Aether Sphere with the uh, Radistral, there's some merchants that show up after uh, every part of this area that you beat. I won't be using any of them, though. Just a little fun fact. gonna heal Gar a little bit here because soon there's gonna be an area where I'm gonna get a lot of encounters. I'll go more in detail when I get closer to it. Alright, that chest over there has an aura disc in it that's going to power up Philia's sword in. <clears throat> I would tell you what the disc is, but it has like two letters and a bunch of numbers on it. So, as you can see, that attack boost from that disc is almost double. So it's really going to be apparent when I start fighting the next boss. Does this R ever get an English release at all? <clears throat> or is it Japan only? Never even played the DS version, so I don't know what I'm missing. Alright, so this area right here is the worst part of the run by far. Nothing touches this. This is the most irritating place. Okay, so let me go into a little explain here. This is a, some little Pac-Man like mini game they thought to stick in because hey it's Namco let's stick in some more cameos why not. Alright so there's these little yellow pellets you have to go grab. When you grab all the pellets it unlocks the elevator so you can go to the next floor. But here's the problem there are imps everywhere. Now you might be thinking are all these imps luck based? Partially. There are two on each floor that spawn in a random location and they track your location as you're traversing through this area. So you'll notice later on, see that's a tracker right there. He's always at that elevator. You'll notice uh, some of the trackers <clears throat> will um, sort of shift back and forth trying to get to my location, but seeing as they cannot reach it because there's some areas they just can't access to. Yeah, that was bad. And uh, they're mostly the reason why this place is bad because the other imps always go into a set direction no matter what. You can change the direction using the uh, electric tiles on the floor to block uh, their progress. Whoa, what was that? Okay, that was weird. That made me go down the floor? But using the electric tile on the floor, you can block their uh, progression you can also change the direction using it. So, I made me a route on all five floors, but it's gonna take a little bit out of the luck in order for it to work correctly. It can easily break. Now, another annoying thing is, uh, some of these uh, routes that I take here rely on cycles. Cycles being, after a certain point in time, I have a small window to run in to a clear open lane. After that time is up, then it closes up and I'm going to have to improvise. And I really, really prefer not to. Now, 
it's best to run away from these guys because it's faster to do so. But there's one imp that I must kill here because at the very, very end of this place, there's a hidden treasure chest. Yes, they do not tell you about this. There's one way you can know the treasure chest is there. If you bring Mary with you, which is an optional character, by the way, she tells you that there's a hidden treasure chest. Now, what's in the treasure chest depends on how many imps you kill here. If you kill no imps, you get just a green gel, which is the worst one. The one I'm eyeing is the Draven Axe. You get that if you kill one imp. So, one of these imps are going to die. I don't know which one I'm going to use. I usually kill a tracker with it. So I try to save my one kill for that. And this imp is giving me all the trouble in the world. Alright, here we go. And this is the last one. Alright, so this one usually is a lot softer. Alright, so this is a safe point here. There's one tracker. See how he's stuck there? There's both of them. Perfect. So my strategy is working fine here. So after this imp touches the here, I'm going to lure them over here and lock them behind here. So now they're out of my hair completely. And I can walk home free and counterless. Now this is one of the hardest floors to go in counterless. The cycles here are pretty hefty. Yeah. All right, I got that. Now I got the tracker imp on the left of me. That way he won't um sort of lock me. If you have more than one imp crunched up in like one little square, it is possible when you get out of uh, one encounter by uh, running or killing one, you can be thrown into another one without being able to move. So this is one of the reasons why I try to uh, lure that imp over to the left over there. So I'm going to kill this one. Alright, so there's one more floor here. <clears throat> and that's what I was talking about. There were two imps all in one location, so I got locked in place and I couldn't move. I'm going to try to attempt to run away again and see if I get out. Usually you get about a split second to move. There you go. And now I'm home free. Well, I thought I was. Oh, and I should mention that too. This is another reason why trackers are annoying. Okay, when you touch an imp, it plays a voice clip. At that point, all imps everywhere usually freeze in where they are. Trackers, they like to bend the rules, you see. They say, you know what? We're not going to stay in our place. We're going to move and try to track your location and make life hell for you. Now you saw that tracker just move right to the left of me. The elevator is right there at the bottom left of my screen. He moved right there where I was going to move. I couldn't move where I was currently because, you know, your controls freeze up when you touch one. But they can move, meaning they can cause more encounters this way. Very, very annoying. But this is the last floor, so... There's not much headache left. And for this last one, this last one... I played with this one on emulator, and it's not that hard, but... I have a visual cue for it on emulator. At the very top of my screen, you first get to the fifth floor, there's these shadows of imps at the top. There's about four of them. There's two that come from the left when you first start, and there's uh, two coming from the right of the screen at the very top. And I usually take off when I see uh, the ones from coming from the left. There's a midpoint directly above you that they go up, and I make a run from it then. But Seeing how, I guess, the resolution's fitting on my TV and everything, I can't see the shadows up there. So I have to take a wild guess when to take off. 
and I took off too early. But if you do it just right, none of them should be able to reach you. Alright, now we're out. And this is the chest. There's the Draven Axe. Alright. Thank the Lord that's over. Gonna heal everybody for safety. Alright. Gonna go over to the next area. There's some uh, really weird puzzles in this place. But the boss here, the boss here will drop another aura disc that will give Philia a ton of attack power. This is where she starts actually doing some real heavy damage to the bosses. After this one, of course. This boss in particular, though, is really tall, so I can't spin slash over him. He does have an attack where he jumps up to the air and sort of floats and starts shooting missiles. If he does that attack, I can run under him and get behind him. Other than that, there's no other way to get past them. Alright, these floors here disappear periodically. Yes, you will fall to the floor below you, but that's all it'll really do. It won't do anything other than that. Alright, that dual helm right there gives an attack bonus, so I equip it just for that reason. Can't go wrong with getting more attack power. Pressing these switches can be a little weird too. You have to be right up next to them in order to interact with them. But if you're a little bit to the left or right of it, you'll just sort of slip off. So if you see me having trouble pressing these switches, that's why. Alright, so here's the big puzzle of this area. There's a lot of switches and a lot of different um, choices to make. <clears throat> My blue, yellow. That's just an hourglass. I don't really use it. But it's in the way, so I just quickly grab it. Alright, this should be the final floor before the boss. Now, when I come back here, there's going to be a lot of disappearing floors. <clears throat> Need to hit these switches. Yeah, doing that part first time, that was really annoying. I don't blame you there. Alright. Some wing boots in that chest, I just grab them just for... No reason. <laughs> They're just there. With some nice looking shoes. Alright. I'm gonna take it a little easy here. Alright, got it. I have fell down there before. Not a good feel. Alright, now you gotta put this little square thing here. Prevent it from pushing all the way back up. Alright, so. The boss here is a little crafty. I don't know how many people like to check 
their stats or anything before they fight a boss when they know a boss fight's about to come up but he uses something on the whole party that screws with your HP and TP to put it at really really small numbers as you can see so I take this moment to fix all of that before I go into the boss fight since TP is very important Oh, wait a minute. I do bring him with me. Uh... Nah, just forget it. Yeah, you can heal yourself. But I can only imagine how many people ran up the steps, got into the fight, and saw their health when they first fought. Got themselves a nice surprise. All right. I'm gonna use my flare bottle here on Philia. But this is the boss I was talking about. He is way too tall to try to go over with Spin Slash. We can lock him into the corner at least. He has this really quick palm attack that will launch you pretty far. To try to get out of your little sandwich tactics. But I'm using Sheed, and so this is also another one of those bosses that likes the block. And I have Sheed in just for this very reason. But he stands no match against this team. And yes, he drops the SW28280, which is a really powerful aura disc. Yeah, this sound, I mean, this song did not make it to the PS2 version. I don't know why they didn't put it in. They put in some completely new song when you face this boss. Wasn't in this game. Now, nah, that's not his body. He jumped into the suit. All right, so that's pretty much the end of the annoying puzzles. Mm, maybe except for one, but that's not anytime soon. I'm not going to worry about that right now. And when we try to fly over to Diecroft, this dragon stops us. So now we got to do something about that dragon. Now, now that we beat Josiah, we can teleport back to the warp room. <clears throat> and now we're going to go to Rodeon instead. Now, I like this place. It's like, this place is real calm and soothing after all that tension. Like the music that plays, the things you got to do here, it's all soothing. I like this place. And look how slow the imps move. So much better. Except when that happens. <laughs> so yeah, what you do here is you grab these bombs here. These really slow mo moving imps moving like this really, really uh, fixed direction back and forth. They're just more or less guarding uh, the warp points. So you got to get rid of them with these bombs. It's a nice way to get some revenge after going through Josiah and having to do all that imp manipulation. <clears throat> I touched one. I don't know what that was. I don't know what to call that. I can't explain it. I'm trying to grab this bomb. Get out of my way. I'm trying to. Oh, huh? Yeah, that's what I thought. 
My bad, I just goofed. And this is the end right here. Oh, you can see this uh, war points looking a little different. All right, no prizes here really. So now, heading on to the next place. All right, there's really not much to the next area as far as puzzles go. There will be this room where I'll have to enter a password. Now, when I get to that part, there's an extra password you can actually enter to win a really, really nice prize. This prize that you get is amazing. It's, think of the Sheen Sword, but it's on steroids. It's a much powerful version of it. It has a hundred hit on it as well, meaning, just like I said before, no one's blocking it. And that is the weapon Storm will be using for the rest of the game. Oh yeah, and fun fact, there's also another uh, secret password that you can enter there. If you enter Ogre, it will plug a Tekken 3 advertisement. I think it makes also a Tekken reference with it as well. <clears throat> Alright. This is an enemy that you have to kill. They're just standing in your way. These enemies have a lot of defense on them. Alright, got rid of them. But yeah, there's surprisingly quite a bit of uh, Tekken advertisements in this. Alright, so we're going to use the wing boots because it would actually be faster than going through the slow conveyor. Because so the area we got to go to next is actually closer to the entrance. right here well not these yet those two computers just give you a hint to what the password is it does look like that though I got ahead of myself again <laughs> now these little fire things there's no really there's really no way to avoid them so I just run through. Whoops, whoa, whoa, whoa. I didn't mean to do that, okay. So, we're gonna enter the optional password first. All right, so, the first thing I entered was gift. In the next room, there'll be a treasure chest right ahead of me with that gift. Now, the actual password is fate. So, this right here is the laser blade. Man, oh man, this weapon is overpowered. So, I already told you before, nobody can block it. It's extremely powerful, and especially powerful for this point in the game. So, Stun is going to turn into a Jedi here for a moment. But yes, this weapon is amazing. This boss is laughable. All she tries to do is use her machines to attack you. But she has really weak defense. As you can see, like, the type of damage I'm doing to her. And just like that, she's down. Yep, that was Eileen. The uh, older woman that Stan went on a date with earlier in the game. She was one of the ones who joined Hugo's forces. Now this part, I don't understand this. After talking some sense into her, she's like, you're right. So, let me just jump out this window. <laughs> And yeah, that's the end of her. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, oh man, the remake version of her. That stupid barrier. I hated that fight so much. But I found out that magic destroys her. So I just spammed magic. I think I spammed Ray, and it worked really, really well against her. Alright, so we got more wing boots, so use the wing boots to get out of here quicker. Alright, it's time to head on back and there's one more spot to take care of. Went into the lab to fix uh, Gar's uh, Sordian. We won't be using it though, so it's just a part of the story that you have to do. If I could skip it, I would. So the next area you have to go to will take care of the mechanical dragon that's been being a really huge pest to us. Alright, so this place is completely dark. There are no random encounters, thankfully. But you need three keys to go up ahead. So, let's look for these keys. Oh, you have to fight these rats. These rats might have the key. Hold up, these ain't rats. But yes, after you beat each one of these guys, they'll drop a key. And there's three of them. By the way, these guys can be really annoying. Because every single one of their layouts are exactly the same. Two of them in front use physical attacks and two of them in the back use magic. It's really easy for them to get that magic off because it doesn't take them that long to cast it. But it's actually pretty strong and it can knock a dent in your HP if you don't watch it. So I like to use Spin Slash to get a little bit closer back there and interrupt them just in case any foolishness happens. Man, that was quick. Fantasia PS1 brought Mystic Arts in first, which is way yet again the next game. I love these hitting sound effects. Use it to my ears. Alright, so that's all the keys. If I can find my way back. Alright. So enter the keys, the place lights up, enter those keys into there, and now we can leave. Okay, so, I like to call the next boss probably the most underrated boss in the speedrun. Not because of like how funny is the fight or the quality of the boss, but it's not the type of boss you'd expect to give you a fight looking at him at first glance. But he's actually very, very annoying. He has these three earthworms with him, and they are so hard to hit. Now the boss himself doesn't really move fast. But he has these attacks where he sicks these insects on you and it just destroys health. So, my best bet with this one is trying to sandwich him, but his earthworms like to dig around a lot and where they end up is completely luck based. So, there's really no surefire way to get rid of the earthworms fast because of that. Oh snap, I did not want to go in there. We don't do that yet. <clears throat> yeah, 
Yeah. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking what was on the next floor. Cool. Favorite character in all of Tales or just this game? This game is easy. Hold up. Hold up. Yeah, there it is. I thought I was tripping. Just this game? Gar is my favorite. I don't play as him though. <laughs> it's better to control Stong. Alright. So, there's a quick little puzzle I have to do here involving a bunch of balls. First we gotta go upstairs and there's this ball I have to drop through the left hole. That treasure chest has a uh, aura disc in it that gives you tornado. Won't be needing that. All right, gotta put the sun up north. This small little ball goes to this ring over here that just automatically jumps inside when you put it close like that. You put that there. Oh wait, no, 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 the thing, the circle thing was supposed to go. Now I messed it up. I had him in reverse. You have to watch this too, because it'll instantly draw it in if you uh, put it too close. <laughs> but yeah, that was my bad. There we go. And then you shoot the sorcerer's ring at the sun, and then the opening to the boss of the area. actually on the same floor <clears throat> yeah the puzzles in this game are actually not that bad going from this to Eternia definitely made me realize how some other Tales of Game have some longer puzzles it's this one all right so I like to really check um, my party's health for this part Alright, I'm going to bring uh, Carol in for this part, because he has an easier time hitting the earthworms than everybody else does. Samba really helps out for this part. This is probably the longest conversation in the entire game, by the way. They talk a lot here. Here we go. Now take a look at this boss and tell me, does this look like a threatening boss? It doesn't to me. So when you run up to the earthworms, they usually dig. Earthworms can put on the herd if you let them. Got him. Alright, that wasn't too bad actually. That was one of the better fights, I'll admit. Alright, just hit the switch and the dragon blows up. Yeah, uh, the PS2 version of this boss, he transforms into this insect. He's way more annoying too. He spawns insects too that can poison you. 
All right, because of the cutscene that plays after you beat the boss, you are not allowed to use wing boots in this room. You have to go into the room outside to use the wing boots to leave here. I mean, if it's too easy with your friend, put it on a higher difficulty. Alright, so... The Aether Spear is forming more and more. After that last shot, pretty much the entire Aether Spear can be walked on. So I don't have to go through those little domes and warp through each place. So now all we gotta do is find the Dragon Ship. Which, unless you got a visual cue, can be pretty hard to do sometimes. I think it's directly below, uh, below where I am right now. <clears throat> Either that or that's the beginning. Nope, there it is. And now we can fly up to the guy behind it all. After hearing a song like that, and then it goes into something soothing like this, so it's kind of funny. Oh, hold up. But yeah, all this place is is uh, going up through elevators to reach the top. There's not much to it other than that. There's a couple enemies here who can cast extremely fast and can possibly get you before you retreat. So there's that to look out for. They aren't really threatening to making you get a game over or anything like that, but they do know um, Demon's Lance. And that's a powerful hitting spell, but it only hits one person. So if they do land it on somebody, it's just gonna probably kill one person. Yeah, these Balrogs, I'm pretty sure they're the ones. All right, so that's the first half of it. And then we just go through the same thing again. There's a blue chest here with another uh, aura disc in it, and it has Blizzard. Even when I did a spell spamming route, I skipped that one. It's not much stronger than what you already have. Oops, there it is. And boss is coming up. All right, gonna fill up on um, some TP here. All right, so it's Hugo himself. He can be a pain if he wants to, and what I mean by that is this guy can teleport. He can cast spells himself, but the only way he'd get that off is if, yeah, at, at the beginning, like right there. Like I said, he can cast that real fast. That's actually a really slow casting spell for whoever you get it for. Oh wow, he got behind me. Okay. This guy's really want to be a pain. Alright. Rudy's getting a little aggressive. And that attack there hurts as well. That's another thing too. He has invincibility frames when he uses that attack. Alright. Taken care of. All right. Well, that's the end of him. 
And now, that was not the final boss. The true bad guy shows up. And now you think you're gonna fight him, but... Yeah, he's got other plans. <laughs> Japanese's voice is coming up. So, fun fact, that movie just used was called Black Wing. He does not use that when you fight him. Which is really funny. Because that move looks actually pretty cool. But, in the PS2 remake, they actually bring it back. I don't know if they never figured out how to make it look like in uh, when you're battling him or what. But he never ever uses it on you. It's not even in his move list, if I remember correctly. So, the adventure is not over yet. Not even close. Alright, so, at this point in the game, you're assigned to go, uh, there's been a monster takeover in the towns across. So really, you can choose what town you want to go to. The fastest town is Armida. Depending on what town you go to, depends on what the kind of uh, what kind of fights you'll get. Armida only has one uh, monster fight. <clears throat> the others give you multiple ones. There's one that gives you a total of five ogre fights, and I believe that's Harmons, but. I'm not going there. And all this is an ogre. Even though it's playing boss music, he goes down pretty fast. Just like that. Yeah, Stan's sister is playable. Uh, there's a glitch to play as her in the Japanese version. They took that glitch out uh, in the English version. She was supposed to be a playable, but they dummied her out. From what I assume, not finishing her up. She still has her moves and everything. She's not really glitchy at all. They just never put her in, I guess. All right, so now <clears throat> gonna go upstairs and we gotta go to this meeting to find out what to do next. So first of all, the Draconis is broken. You have to go get this ore to go get it fixed. The second thing you also have to do is go to the Sordian R&D lab to go power up your Sordians even more. Now, unlike in the PS2 version, you don't fight uh, Daimlos. You just go there, it gets it done, and then you leave. It actually powers up all Sordians by 100, so it actually does do something. It's not just some story only related thing so the Sordian lab is over here so it's faster to just go ahead and get it out of the way first alright so here comes a little more luck into the game alright so I don't understand the properties behind this but in the Sordian R&D lab you have a small chance to run into an enemy called the uh, 
the lens golem. If you run into this enemy, you will be unable to run away. So for this reason, I equip the Draven Axe because he actually absorbs light. So if you want to fight him, do not use light or he heals. Alright, this place can be... Oh, I already messed it up. This place can be kind of annoying. You have to shoot these in order to uh, make pillars appear. But if you see those little small indents on the ground, if you touch those, it resets everything. Luckily, I didn't touch them. Well, Gotta grab this. Now, this puzzle's randomized, so it's really painful. I have a solution here. I might have to look through my notes for this, though. Yeah, I might have to. Now, the weird thing about this puzzle is you can't actually um, change these when the laser's on. You have to turn the laser off. Yeah, I'm gonna have to reset the whole thing. So this might take a bit. <clears throat> There we go. Got it. All right. Now in the PS2 version in this room right here, you actually fought the spirit of your sword. And it was probably the coolest battle in the game. But yeah, the PS1 version, that's not in. Maybe one day when I run that game. I can showcase that. Oh no, I ran into the lens golem. Here he is. Alright. Good thing I get to show him to you guys. Because he's actually a rare encounter. But yeah, there he is in all his glory. This golem right here prevents you from running away. As you can see, my retreat option was completely uh, unpickable. But yeah, he goes down pretty fast, as long as you don't have the laser blade equipped. Because every time you hit him, he heals like 500 HP. And he's just a pain to deal with. Now for some reason, they don't count this as a dungeon. And I don't get it. Because you're not allowed to use the wing boots to get out of here. So, it's not long, but it'd be better if you could just use wing boots and get out of here without having to deal with the encounters here. Alright, so now we head over to Trash Mountain, which is where our ore to fix the ship will be.
Now, they don't let you go into Trash Mountain until you get to this point of the game. You can go to uh, Junkland. That's where Trash Mountain is. But there's not much you can do there. There's a junk collector there, and he sells you some really weird stuff. There's this unidentified weapon he'll sell to you for 99,999 gal. And you'll think that's a crazy ripoff, but in actuality, it's a laser blade. Once you use a room bottle on it. So if you didn't get the laser blade <clears throat> earlier, and pretty much for free, you can get it here. Yeah, Junkland is pretty depressing. And Philia is losing her mind because she's wondering why people are living literally in garbage. Alright, so... I usually skip this, but it's incredibly risky to do so, so I'm not going to do that this time. Now, this is the guy who sells weapons. It's this dude. This guy has something called Neutralizer that'll uh, make me immune to the nauseous gases inside Junkland. So while this is in effect, I won't be uh, taking damage when I go past the uh, gas fumes. Now, without this, every time you step a little bit into the gas fumes, you take massive damage. And yes, you can get a game over if you uh, do it too much. So... And it's just like a holy bottle too, it uh, runs out after a while. So those little purple gases, those will hurt you if you don't have a neutralizer turned on. So I'd rather not take that chance. So I gotta equip the... I don't really need the uh, Draven X anymore. There's no more unrunnable enemies around here. You can run from anybody. Now, this place actually has some really powerful equipment. In one of my older routes, I used to actually get a weapon here called uh, Bahamut's Tear. And it was the strongest axe in the game. And it's very, very good. But you have to go so far out of your way to get it, because it's on the other side, very inconveniently placed. But I got it anyway because it destroyed everything when you got it. Not to mention there was no element tied to it either. Which means, when you get later into the game, there's a lot of bosses that have uh, elemental resistance to everything. Most notably, the final boss's final form. Without that, he goes down real quick. There will be other Tales of Runs, but I'm not going to be the one doing them. Next will be Tales of the Abyss by DeBellers and Zesteria by Fel Visage. This is my second one I'm doing. Now, I have done a run of uh, Tales of Fantasia PS1, but Yagamoth only runs uh, Tales of Fantasia, so I let him have that one. And that would have been three games for me to run. If we do another one of these, I'd like to bring something new to the table. Hopefully, uh, Tales of Destiny... Uh... Wait, why am I in the food? Tales of Destiny uh, PS2 will be all down pat to me by then. <clears throat> I think in this room was where the... Uh... The aura is. But yeah, there's not much left of the game after this. The only thing left we have to do after this is we have to go get three large lens for the lens cannon. Then we take off the Draconis to the final dungeon. And the final dungeon is actually laughably short compared to the PS2 version. The PS2 version is long. 
so long compared to this game. It's pretty straightforward in this version. And the only uh, puzzle you have to do is towards the end. But man, it is long in the PS2 version. And there's our ore. So now, like usual, wing boots. And alright, we're out. What the? The exit's over here. I don't know where I was going. Like, I'm sorry, I love the rest of the game, but that final dungeon, I was not a fan of that at all when I first played through that. I was just asking myself constantly, is this ever going to end? Although that mirror room and that dungeon, that was the best part. But the part afterward, I'm sorry, I, I'm i not a fan of that. By the way, that mirror room is in the PS1 version. It's different though. Oh no, don't remind me. Yeah, I'd actually have to route that place out and everything. That's gonna be fun. Hopefully that I'm speedrunning it won't feel as long. It's what most of these puzzles have felt like. When you speedrun, these blow by so fast. And when you remember actually playing this casually, they don't feel nowhere near as long. Wait, did I overshoot it? Uh oh. It's over here, isn't it? Yeah. That mini map confuses me. Alright, gotta talk to the king. Oh yeah, by the way, you see that crab there? That's actually a free crab you can pick up. I think the crab's dead. But it just stays there. You can put it inside your food sack, but I got no reasons to have it right now. Yeah, you're miss uh You're just in time for the tail end of it. There's not much left. So we gotta give the ore to him. And then we go back to the king again. I never played a I wanna be the guy game, but a lot of those look ridiculous. <laughs> I'd be dialing like five hundred times in that game. I don't know if I'd ever be satisfied with a run in a game like that. Or I die like 10 times and I'm like, ugh. This doesn't feel that great. I mean, I beat it, yeah, but. I died so many times, it feels sloppy. Alright, we gotta talk to this old man. He gives us the deets. Actually, let me just go to Cresta first. <clears throat> Cresta's large lens is pretty interesting. You have to talk to the mayor first. And after talking to him, he really doesn't want to part with it at first. After being convinced to do it to save the world, he will admit that he has no clue where it is. Luckily for me, I know exactly where it is. It's in here. Now you have to dig in the right spot. I think it's always in the same spot. Yeah. I was close to it. So that's one of them.
Alright, the next location is Harmits. That old man I talked to at the very beginning of the game has it. And he will not let it go until you give him all of your money. Yes, every penny. Luckily, he gives it back when you uh, try to leave. We can head on back now. Oh yeah, and the last one, I forgot to mention this one. This one's funny. You have to go back to Straylized Forest. <clears throat> Instead of going straight, you go to the right. This is why you talk to the old man, because he tells you about this guy. And he's some random thief you fight. Now, once again... People, how they appear on the overworld, do not tell the whole tale. This guy looks human here, but look at how he looks when you fight him. Does that look like a human being? No. But he dies just as fast as any other ogre. That's what I love about the older games. The sprites were just so goofy. Like it made them look human, then you fight them, and it's like, wait, that is not how you look on the overworld. Alright, give the lens to this dude. And then you tell the king and this is the quote-unquote final cutscene of RPG games that's really really long before the final battle <clears throat> it just looks a little shorter because of how fast text can go away in this game If you have optional characters at this part, Stan will talk to him. So in this case, Carol will get talked to. If Bruiser's with you, he'll uh he'll have like two girls under his arms. He'll talk about like his biggest dreams and stuff is to get all the girls in the world or something like that. It was something stupid like that. I forgot what Chelsea says and Mary. I think Mary just talks about how she wants to win so Dallas doesn't die or something but anyway final dungeon incoming
Oh, wait. <laughs> I keep forgetting this part. You're supposed to fire the cannon first. <laughs> I was out there like, let's go on ahead, but no, you... The Aether Sphere is all closed up now, you can't even enter it, so this is the point of this part. You have to shoot a hole into it. They shoot it the first time, and nothing happens. The Aether Sphere absorbs it. Monsters keep coming out because they invaded Radistral, so what do we do? And then, Riker just tells you to shoot Radistral down. Because remember, Radistral is still up in the Aether Sphere, still in that same location and everything. And that's what you're about to see get destroyed in this cutscene. Bye bye. And that's your opening to get inside the Aether Sphere. Alright, and we can go ahead and head all the way back to the final dungeon. No need to wait, let's do it now. Alright, I'm going to take a little detour over here because this has Carol's strongest weapon. So I'm going to just nab that. You have to collect fragments in this place to form an emblem. If you've played some Tales of Games before, you know about a certain emblem. This certain emblem prevents a certain, I want to call, blockade from stopping you from going to the final boss. This blockade usually warps you to another room, usually a prison. Get what I'm saying? So you probably know what I'm going at here. Now, in this game, you have to go into the prison one time because the last fragment is actually in the jail cell. So you gotta go in there at least one time. Alright, so it's mostly just running here. Alright, that place is locked. You can't go through there yet. Now this is that blockade I was talking about. Just some little sign on the ground, you know how it goes. Alright, so you gotta go free your boys from the jail cells. They have a jail cell for each character, even optional characters. Each character has their own kind of jail cell. So after getting everybody, they won't let you leave this place until you get everybody. So don't even think about saying, well, I don't like this character, so I'm going to leave him. No, they're not going to let you do that.
Alright, now I can finally use Cloak again. Rudy's always in the last one, but I thought that was the last one. I think that one's for Chelsea. But anyway. Alright. I'm gonna save here, just in case the next puzzle I don't die on it somehow. I don't know how that would happen. I'd have to really be slipping for that. Alright, the reason I hang very low at that area, when you run close to those mirrors, they just break. And you can't really move forward after that happens while the breaking animation happens, so it's faster to just hang a little lower there. Alright, this room has a lot of mirrors, and you have to break the right one. To know how you got the right one, you'll see a set of stairs. There we go. And there's that breaking animation I was talking about. Oh, there is a save point here. Alright. Okay, so... There's two more puzzles in the game, but this is the longer one. <clears throat> this first starts off, Stan gets separated from everybody else, so he's by himself for this entire area. But, on the bright side, there are no enemy encounters. So what you gotta do here is you gotta find these gems, and you have to rearrange them in the right direction. Hold up, there's one gem I didn't get. And they're all color-coded. When you get to a certain part of this area, it'll all tell you what direction you need to put them. Now, for these mirrors on the wall, you don't want to get too close to them. Because if you do, Stan will get drawn into it and he'll have to fight a clone of himself. So you use these coffins to put in front of him and Stan won't see his shadow. Preventing him from having to fight them. Gotta hit this. Gotta hang real low for that one. The range for that one is pretty wide. Alright, it's dark for this part. You have to sort of hug the walls here to know where to go. Alright, purple gem. Alright, there is one you have to do. These coffins respawn their location. So, the place where I just moved this coffin from is going to go right back there. So, despite me doing all this dodging, I have to fight at least one shadow. But that's good in a way, so y'all get to see what he looks like. But he's not hard. Oh, wow. I never had that happen. Anyway. He's free, as you can see. <laughs> now, he does have a... Uh, he does have some hard-hitting skills on him. He has a uh, Stan's ultimate skill on him already. That you have to do a lot of stuff for yourself in order to get. But as you can see... He's kind of laughable. Alright. 
This chest has a fairy ring. Very important for the end here. And we're out. All right. So, gotta do some rearranging here. I'm gonna take Ruti out of the party for this part. And I'm going to give the uh, fairy ring to Carol for this part. But yeah, there's only really one more puzzle left and that puzzle's really, really short. So the end of the game is drawing near. Uh, assassin. I forgot about Phoenix. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Phoenix is his ultimate move. My bad. Oh, by the way, speaking of Phoenix. Okay. Let me talk about some things that I'm not going to do in this run. But are really, really cool to explain and talk about. Alright, so. For anyone who's played this game. Phoenix is the final move you can get for Stan. It's a really, really cool move that uh, Stan grows extremely large. He turns into a Phoenix and he dashes across the screen, damaging everybody. Now, there's a really cool glitch you can do with this move. I don't know how many people noticed, but I found this last year. And I made a video of it and threw it on my YouTube. It doesn't seem like anybody really knew about it, but if you get poisoned, then you use Phoenix. How it first goes is Stan grows and he jumps off screen. While he is off screen and he is about to use his Phoenix attack, he will die if he's poisoned. So while he's dead, the Phoenix fire will still be there if you revive him right after that with a life bottle. So in this moment, you are completely invincible. No one can damage you. And since the Phoenix Fire is still surrounding you, you cannot be harmed by anything. Meaning you are invincible and you are a walking hitbox. And the hitbox is very, very large and it hits very, very fast. So you can stand in front of bosses and absolutely annihilate them. In my video, I uh, showed myself doing it to the last three bosses of the game. So. The last three bosses are here. So, Kronos decided to revive Leon. So we have to fight a zombie version of Leon. You can tell because he's actually miscolored here. And usually he gets this off. Now he's going after Carol. This is a fight that they took out of the PS2 version, by the way. But I always thought this was cool. Alright, now, this Leon actually absorbs dark, and he's weak against light, and the laser blade is light, so it does some really good damage against him. Now, for the first form of the final boss. This guy loves to fly around a lot, so it would be in your best interest to hit him as much as you can to keep him grounded. Now if you let him, um, after hitting him a lot, and you let him free, he will teleport to the top of the screen, and it's really hard to hit him from up there. The best way to hit him, I found, is Samba from Carol. So this is where I meant why Carol playing a huge role near the end of the game. Yeah, he tried to fly away. See you later. Alright, final boss time. Now, if you've seen the PS2 version of the final boss, he does not look like this. He looks uh, a little laughable compared to him. Now, this guy loves to teleport. The most dangerous thing about him is teleporting and he'll try to cast a spell. So, this boss can really put a scare on you. He knows some really strong stuff. He knows Divine Power, Black Hole, and I'm pretty sure Meteor Storm. So whatever you do, do not give him the time of day to cast.
Now we got him in a pickle. Got him. And that's game, folks. That's Tales of Destiny. Nice. <laughs> so, the Eye of Alamani is pretty much out of control right now. And if something's not done, it'll explode and destroy everything. So, to destroy the Aether Spear and the Eye of Alamani without any collateral damage, let's, well, not to say collateral damage, because <laughs> there will be. You gotta throw the Swordians in. So this is where the game gets kind of sad, because now you gotta part with your Swordians. And yes, they will be destroyed in the process, they do not come back. Sorry. Here we go. Ectinos. Oh yeah, and I'm, I have Clemente equipped. How about Clemente? See you later, at white. And I'm loose. Now somebody was talking about how fast the run speed in this game is. I wish I could run that fast. And they're just doing their walking animation. And they're moving that fast. Oh, and Stan cusses. <laughs> you know those early PS1 games. For those of you who played Final Fantasy VII and Barrett. Oh, and Sid too. How can I forget him? That reminds me. I love putting them both in my party just because they like to cuss a lot. <laughs> the code for the crying icon is crying Kirby. No space.
Now, for the many times that I've completed a run, and I watch this at the end, people think this is the actual planet getting destroyed. It's like, wait, how is this a happy ending? You just destroyed the world. But nah, this is the Aether Sphere getting destroyed. <laughs> if this is the planet, then I was really the bad guy all along. Alright, well, luckily I cannot skip these credits, so. There is a uh, final cutscene that plays after this. Well, you still have time because uh, Abyss is supposed to begin in 25 minutes. Well, technically, there is 15 minutes left plus 10 minutes of credits. Uh, uh, 15 minutes left for you. Plus 10 minutes of setup, sorry. So I don't know how long are the credits, but I think you can do it. Okay, that's fine. Okay. By the way, I hope your run was pretty fine because I slept until the end. Yeah, it went alright. Good. Everything I was worried about went fine, so that's all I was worried about. <laughs> hey, my mouth is dry. Production IG, yup. All the little anime cutscenes has production IG. This game did not come out in Europe. Tales of Eternia did not either. I have no clue why, but yeah, I actually just learned that like a year ago. I thought it did. Yeah, about buying the game. Uh, so let me get into detail on how much I spent to buy this game on disc. It cost me about $85 for this. <laughs> That's in good condition, by the way. Mint condition, disc, instruction booklet. It even had the little extra... What is it? No little Namco advertisement stuff for like their other products and stuff 
channel your energy into these other great titles. Like a little booklet. Came with everything. But, if you don't mind uh, Japanese, you could get the Japanese version of the game. It's a lot cheaper. And yeah, Tales of Eternia, that cost me about $115. Also in mint condition. So yeah, I spent some money for these, but I wanted to speed run them that badly. They had like no runs of them, so I had to jump on these for that reason. I was hoping they put them on PSN. But I gave up on that. Now, what's really odd about this? Every single party member that you can get is here. Yet, some of them you could have not even done anything to get them and they'll still show up like Chelsea for example you simply have to go back to a uh, Gar's throne and she'll be sitting right there <clears throat> I think after you uh, get the boot disc for Radistral in the second half you can go get her You can get 100 plus for your Tales of Eternity PS1 copy? More than likely, if it's not in really, really bad shape. Like, every auction I see going for it, it's always over 100. So, uh, Bertin, um, actually, because uh, Dabbledore is not streaming at his place, like he is never doing uh, for the Habis run, uh, they will have probably need, they will probably need uh, more time to set up in order to be sure they do it correctly. So, if you can like fill up for the next uh, 15 minutes, if you have something, feel free to do. Uh, all right. Uh... Maybe, maybe you can show the Phoenix glitch first of all. Oh yeah, the save glitch. I can show that off. Well, uh, let's go. You can you can have fun. All right. I guess I can show that off. Infinite Phoenix. I would do that, but I have no save files with that, and that takes forever to get. Let's see. All right then. Well, that's the end. And uh, you know how these older games go. When you see the ending, it sort of locks you there. You can't get out. So I'm gonna have to reset the game myself. All right. Since I have a little uh, extra time, I guess I could um, show a couple of glitches off that I know that I can actually do that won't take a bunch of our time up. <clears throat> Let's see. First, I need to see if I have some save files to show this off. 
Actually, if I don't, I have another way of doing it. I could show another glitch off as well. <laughs> this one involves the Japanese version. I'd have to uh, plug in my Japanese PS2 for that. It's not far away. It's like right below my uh, PS2 Slim. But I'll show this one off first if I got the files for it. Okay, so I think this is... Let's see what this is first. Okay, so this moment right here is uh, after the first half of the game and then stuns by himself. Okay. So what is this file? Oh, I actually, looks like I already glitched this. <laughs> So uh, I might need to explain myself here, seeing as uh, what my status screen is looking like right now. Okay, um, so where do I start? All right, so when you save in this game, you uh, it saves sort of in a process of increments. What I mean by that is when it starts the saving process, it saves each part of uh, the data in the game little by little so um what you can do is if you pull your memory card out at the right time when it's saving when you're trying to overwrite a file it can partially overwrite certain parts of that file meaning that uh with who i have right here right now I could bring over this character data over to that other file I tried to load where Stan was by himself. And other things such as that. And it also has other uh, crazy side effects. Such as uh, unlocking dummy weapons. <laughs> Seeing as uh, some of these things I could not get. Such as like 55 of a sword <laughs> Fifty-five of herbs. Let's see. Oh yeah, fifty-five of summons. <laughs> now, okay, so one of the side effects it's had before. This is a little bit different than um what I've had on another file. But there's a certain file that I've had when I did the save glitch I think it was in the process of trying to overwrite the saves and I pulled it out just at the right time as it was trying to overwrite the items that I had and it ended up giving me 55 of everything but it was a different set of items than this so uh let's see let me check my other memory cards real quick, because I have uh, three of them here. Oh, and by the way, yeah, 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 I should uh, talk about that too. A lot of these are dummies. Like, Chaltier 2, you cannot get these. These are dummy items. Uh, At White 2, that's a dummy. Chameleon, that was a summon, I think, in uh, Tales of Fantasia's SNES. It, you cannot use it. I can go into a fight, but it will not show up as an option. A lot of these are dummy. It's just there for show, I guess. But yeah, Chameleon was a uh, dummied out summon item. Well, Luna isn't dummied. You can get it from a uh, warehouse in uh, Heidelberg. So let let me see uh, what files I have here. Oh, I can't even see what they are. Okay, let me soft reset here. Okay. Whoa, these are all the same. Okay, I see what these are now. Okay, so... Let me also explain this. Alright, this area right here, this is right before... Uh, 
I go back in and right before the end of the first half of the game. So, this is pretty much the last time you get to have Leon in your party. So, one thing I like to do is, you can bring Leon back to your party for the second half. One way you can do that is by using a save glitch. And I can show you guys that real quick. So first, I don't know which one of these two. I think the second one was that one. But yeah, I'll save over this real quick. And all right, so whatever file you want to quote unquote transfer over to another clean file is uh, the one you want to pull out the memory card for. So for this case, this is the file I want to bring Leon over to uh, this file right here who has nobody. So this is how I usually do it. Now it takes a little bit of timing and practice to uh, get the feel for this. So how I look at this is I wait for um, the characters on the status screen here such as Stan, he's just moving around left and right and such. When he stops moving, I usually count the two and then I pull it out. Once you pull it out, you can pull it back in soft reset load it and see if it worked if you did it right you should definitely see a difference in your file so uh, here we go I haven't done this in a while so I might be a little bit off one two I might have did a little too soon there but we'll see Yeah, I did it too soon. Oh, actually, no. I did it too late. Because it over... Rode over everything. Alright. We can try a different file. To try to use this on. Okay. We try it on this. But first, I'm going to make a uh, copy of that one. Because if you overwrite it and... It doesn't do it correctly you don't get a second shot so it's best to make a uh, backup file just in case so I think this is like at the end of the game or something so let me try I'm gonna save over this all right Alright. So let's try this again. One, two. Alright. Let's see if it worked that time. Ah, there we go! there you have it everybody's already in my party now here's a little um, neat little thing that I found completely by accident I usually do it at this part because Leon is actually pretty useful he's dead right now but having him and his dragon blade is very useful so when you get to the part where you actually have to fight him and you beat him he's still around he'll never go away so you can spam Dragon Blade by Stun and uh, Leon and you can just stun light bosses for days so here's a little neat thing so the weapon data for this also transferred as you saw in my file Stun had nothing equipped except for these two accessories but look Daimlos is equipped how can this be Okay, so let me finish the rest of this part here and show you where I'm about to get into here. It should be before <clears throat> Lilith tells Stan to go get uh, some fish. This is what this should be at. 
Yeah, she's right there. Yep. Because I already spoke to the uh, merchant and everything. Okay, so next cutscene. Philia comes in, even though she's already on the team, technically. She comes in and she gives Stan Daimlos back. Okay. When you get that from her, and he's already got one equipped, that means you actually have two. Now, the game has no idea how to calculate this correctly. As I can uh, prove it here. There's two different ones. So, this means I can give her one, give Leon one, and I can give uh, Philia one. So, check this out. If I set them all to have Dimelos, which I can do. Equip everybody with one. You get a Daimlos, you get a Daimlos, everybody gets one. Now let me go into the next uh, fight here. Show you what I'm getting at here. Don't want to ruin this right here. Alright. Let's get into a counter first. Come on. Okay. So, look at my party. Everybody has Dymos equipped. The first one that I have, the game doesn't even detect it. It's supposed to only allow one person to have one so right now everybody has one even though I only have two of these but I can give everybody one and yes everybody can use the spells now what's really crazy about this Sordians can get experience as well and every time you finish a fight since everybody has Dymos equipped, he gets four times the experience than normal because of this. Since everyone has cleared the fight with one equipped. So this is a really funny thing you can do pretty much at any time. You can only do it with this one because uh, it's the only one that uh, you receive from somebody after it being taken away. Yes. You actually get four times the experience from this. So if you do this from this point on, I think he's around in the 60s or 70s in level. But yeah, you can juice up the sword a lot by doing this. So I just wanted to show that off. So another thing I can uh, 